we have arrived at that fated day where one team will emerge victorious here at the Mythic Dungeon Invitational Global Land. What a performance coming out from Shell's Angels. This is Method NA's chance to close this out. They're going to be in the intermission and ultimately Method NA, 0%. The dance is going to begin. Method NA, Shell's Angels. Method put the dagger in China's ambitions in this tournament. Shell's Angels looking to do the same to Method, having already dispatched one team. Gentlemen, will they make it a second? My name is Robert Wing, and helping me close out this incredible tournament, Sloot, Jack, Sowers. Gentlemen, I wouldn't have it any other way. This is going to be incredible. This is it. This is what we're here for, and we're going to have the best performance out of both teams. It's going to be All the way from time trials uh, to this very moment, how many teams have, this was their ambition, this is where they wanted to go, and now we're down to two, Jack. It's an incredible, you know, length of time that we've really been able to see having, you know, the MDI form, having the time trials, proving grounds, everything going into this, and really showing where these teams have gotten, you know, and a lot of conventional wisdom of, of oh, which teams are going to be winning, where are we going to be able to see each group going into it, and such an impressive performance we've been able to see out of both squads actually getting to this level. Yeah, as you said, Sowers, you yourself have had are, are no stranger to competing in this style of event. What is that journey like to make it all the way to this pen ultimate point where it's just you and one other team remaining? I can't even imagine what it would be like to be on the stage with them. You know, Shell's Angels went into EU, people weren't really looking at them. I was like, oh, Method EU, this team is this team's the best in the region, they're gonna win. Shell's Angels knocks them out of the tournament. Coming into this event, everyone's like, oh, Method Pog Champ, okay, these guys, they're definitely the best in the tournament. Shell's Angels knocks them out of the tournament. Now, Method and A came through the winner's bracket and the lawyer looking to be perhaps the best team in the tournament. Shell's Angels, they might be going for the Method hat trick here. Right, let's frame this properly if somehow you didn't get a chance to see when these two teams played before. Uh, Shell's Angels was looking dominant. They were looking powerful. They had a plan. They were executing. And then they started hitting these speed bumps, these moments where things did not go correctly and ultimately it cost them the series. Do we expect this to go the same way? I, I mean, it's totally possible. You know, we've talked about how they kind of get some risky play going. They pulled it off just fantastic in the previous series on the Volt of the Wardens. It could happen again. That's just how they play. There's always going to be that small percentage that something just goes wrong in these massive pulls and they wipe. But I mean, they're on fire right now. They really have shown, you know, the more that they're able to play on stage and the more that they're able to play with the pressure onto them, they've been able to just take these smaller adjustments that they need to perform you know, fantastic throughout this, uh, the tournament, and they've only gotten better. Yeah, th their Vault per performance was much better today than it was yesterday, and that dungeon is available to them again here, so they can perform like that in all these dungeons. We did see they're a little shaky in Lost Souls, but like we said, like they weren't very practicing here, but, you know, Klaus uh, made a very good point that this map pool really favors them here, and if they can just, you know, stay good and stay strong, it's going to be a really, really good for them. As we said, this is a rematch. With the caveat, it will now be a best of five instead of a best of three. And we are beginning on Cathedral of Eternal Night, a map neither of these teams any stranger to. I mean, it's going to a lot of this is going to come down to that big moment, especially with the bolstering that we're going to see here on those imps. That really seems to have defined a lot of the team's success or failures on this map. Of course, the rest of the dungeon will be difficult, mind you, on this 25 setting. But it's going to be a tough one, and that's when we're going to hold our breath and see how they do. I'm extremely curious, starting out in Cathedral, to know if Shells is going to go for that same approach when it comes to those scavenger impacts. Are they going to pop the Bloodlust there? Are they going to go all in? We saw it did not work for them last time. It didn't really work for them as going into it, but I think now we're finally seeing Twitch chat kind of leaning in the favor of Shells Angels there, where so many times, in, even from our side as well, you know, kind of counting out Shells Angels in some situations where, you know, that now that they've been you know, on this hot streak, now they've taken down, like you said, two Method teams are looking to, you know, get the revenge against Method NA here. I'm just really excited to be able to see, you know, where they can really do and have those small adjustments to improve. This is only the second time chat has voted against Method in this tournament, and last time they were also correct when Free Marzi knocked Method Pogchamp down the lower bracket could chat be right again maybe they're the maybe they know much more than us what's so incredible is after we saw this match yesterday between these two teams all of us kind of went back and just had these in-depth discussions because there was so much to talk about speaking of things to talk about the compositions double monk warlock no surprise coming out from method na shells angels also looking fairly familiar both teams just kind of reverting to what their comfort picks have been throughout this tournament no huge surprises on either side for me yeah, at this point, you know, we've been able to see you know, that so many, uh, so much of their preparation has just been on making sure they're working on you know, the comps that are going to work best for them and throughout the widest variety of dungeons. 
Yeah, it's interesting, of course, the Mint, known for his Boomkin, going against the Boomkin at the very end. We'll see which, who was right. Was it this is Walker it. or the Boomkin? The best of five. The opening cuts begin now. Cathedral of Eternal Night. Here we go. Oh, it's actually Jack this time. Oh, that's oh, right. Oh, my goodness. I missed you so much. Aww. Starting off, of course, I love you as well, but uh, starting off here in the Cathedral, we're going to expect to see the same thing from both of his teams, likely. Big pull coming up here while the two healers get a bit of healing off, and they're going to run right upstairs, getting ready for the rest of the team to kill themselves off, and then they will res them upstairs. As you can see, JB already stealthing through here. Yeah, I like this, the healing that you're calling out that they were getting ahead of time off the meters that we were able to see off them. But anyway, both healers running ahead, making sure that they're going to be able to just get upstairs, get it off the mass res to be able to get in with the group. It's very easy, for example, to have the druid be able to just stealth and start running. But the paladin, you have to be able to do a little finessing. Uh, you likely will be, uh, you, you always have to make sure you're using your invisibility potion. After the fact that it happens, you want to make sure you're just watching out as best you can. And Mitt going down a bit early there for them. I mean, he will be able to release and come right back in, but that's five seconds on the board that they really don't want. Plus, all the time lost that mid would have helped with that DPS. Not too much time lost overall, but when you're talking about these two titanic teams here, every little mistake is going to count. Divinefield getting quite low there while they're hoping to kill off the rest of this trash. Interestingly enough, they are looking to kill Dulzak. Yeah, and that was the interesting change that we've been able to see out of both teams that, you know, Shells Angels does prefer to end up killing Dulzak, making sure that they're going to be able to have that a little bit extra trash percentage, whereas Method NA just burn everything as rapidly as possible and focus on just getting upstairs as quickly as they could. And of course, for those at home, we are now in back in the bolstering setting, meaning any trash that dies will buff everything, including bosses, around it for 20% current health and damage. So you can see the team is making a really big effort here to make sure that everything is DPS down evenly and killed evenly. Yeah, then right here you're seeing, you know, Seer just getting the mass res off as he's standing right above. He might actually end up interrupting his cast due to the quaking there. So Method NA, you know, getting a little bit of a lead as they will be able to mop the trash up just a bit faster here. Always important to note that, you know, Shell's Angels starts with a little bit more trash percentage here. So it will be interesting to see as we're going forward here. Just a slight advantage of Method on A side. Yeah, we definitely had a bit of a hiccup on both sides. Uh, one extra death, if I'm not mistaken, on top of what should have been 5-4. to four. JB not having to incur that death in order to go res, as he as a druid will be able to stealth through. But uh, Sierra had to eat that death, get that pylon down, and res up. Big pull for the trash coming up here for Shell's Angels on the left side. Method on A just now cleaning up the rest of the trash before getting access to Agronox. Yeah, and right here, you're just being able to see the focus of you know Shell's Angels getting everything in together here. And really, Sierra just kind of taking his time before he actually does run in to start contributing extra damage here, watching into the positioning of everybody else and get, making sure all of the, for example, the botanists are getting interrupted. Always important to be watching out for those blistering rains here. And then previously we'd seen with Method NA, we're you know, watching out for those walkers and they can get extremely high bolster stacks. I was actually just about to mention that that walker is looking just a bit scary right now as they're starting to work on it. He was a bit too high health, getting an extra bolster stack there. Certainly don't want one of those stomps to get off. Grips it at the very last second, does well to displace it. That stomp plus those bolster stacks definitely would have led to a death, especially in this fortified setting. Yeah, it's something that they were really no stranger to already as they had to encounter those walkers right after Agronox. But getting into the fight here, they are going to be moving on towards that middle garden area to allow all of the little flowers to start funneling in here. And from there, you're going to be watching as they try to get as much damage onto it, especially when they're a little bit, you know, have the advantage with the warlock to be able to get all the dots up to it there and start cleaving immediately. Shell's Angels branching out just a bit here on this boss, making sure to actually CC that smaller tree on the left side of the screen, not wanting to deal with it as the first of the flowers come into the boss, they do start to kind of round them up, slow them, stun them, and cleave them down. Well, if only your puns would branch out, Ted. I mean, I, I, I usually have some more, but I'm pretty stumped right now. Oh. Getting ready, Agronog's down to 60% on Method NA as Bloodlust has been popped finally on the Method side. We saw it earlier for Shells Angels, already down to 6 minutes, 20 seconds remaining on that cooldown. Both teams pretty close to each other right now. Shells Angels having the smaller advantage of Trash, in, even though one of them is CC'd on the side, as they did opt uh, to kill Dolzak earlier, giving them that slight lead, but also a slight decrease in time on the boss here. Yeah, interesting to see it was Shells Angels taking care of this walker and having to you know, focus on constant displacing it. It'd be interesting to see how long they'd be able to keep it up because, again, they don't want to be bolstering the boss to this. So it just requires a lot more micromanagement that I think that they really want to have to deal with here. Succulent Lashers being well kept away from the tank as much as possible as they do melee harder than the boss himself. So boss plus that with a toss up on the tank from the boss could be lethal and have one of those perks proc early. Certainly something you don't want to have before getting into Thrash Bites room uh, where a lot of those imps are quite dangerous for the tank. You're seeing Hero going down with Zero dropping incredibly low here. Like we were talking about with just the stomp coming out 
out from the walker with so much micromanagement required to actually deal with it. You are seeing a quick grip coming out onto it. They are able to get Hera back up and to be able to continue dealing with it, but that's no battle res they have available. So the mid also going down, so that battle res will also be burned on their side as well. They're trying to be wait for him to be able to get back up here. This is scary. Agronox is 19%, and that walker is already sub 10%, something like that, based on that health. If they buff the uh, Agronox here, it's going to be absolutely lethal for them. A lot of damage coming out. They're going to need to babysit it for a while. Method and A finally downing Agronox, burning one more death here, and they will get ready to move over towards the second boss's room. Agronox now at 4% for Shell's Angels as they look to well maintain, finish off that walker and Agronox himself. Yeah, they actually did have a good move by mid to make sure he actually held off on, on accepting the battle res there because they were close enough to be able to play it safely. I like being able to see them kind of skipping around to the side here to start moving through a lot of this trash. This was, I believe, on Method and A's side where they actually were struggling with some of those walkers before, so it looks like a little bit of an adjustment on their part to make sure they're not even going to deal with those and then just move on to those larger impacts and then going on to Thrash Bites room. This is still largely neck in neck, folks, but we do have the small differences that can lead to a big difference by the end of it. Only one death up for Shell's Angels, and they don't have that battle res available as we go into this larger pull room. As we can see, Shell's Angels pulling essentially everything that they can, doing a huge rip here, and they're really once again going to need to babysit here for the bolstering. We have those scavengers in there that have the higher health pool than the imps. Yeah, very important to watch out for as we, we've seen in the past where Warlocks have been able to get the banishes, and you're seeing Marv do on the side of Method NA there, making it much easier to avoid those higher health mobs. You are also just seeing you know, the little mind control that went out onto one of them to make sure that the bolster stacks are just being negated whenever they can. So right here, you know, you've seen these massive scavengers that have a lot of HP left available to them. They really need to make sure they're switching targets here and able to just focus it down as the scavenger keeps on gaining more HP and consuming a lot more of their time. Yeah, I and mean, we mention it every time. That sliver of health on these super bolstered mobs is actually quite a bit of raw HP. Very dangerous. Can easily one-shot the tank, causing that perk territory, which is why you see uh, Divine Field being just so defensive. They do finally successfully get it down and start to move into the rest of the room, grabbing as much as they can before they need to engage Gaze Racks, that kind of eye boss, a mini boss, if you will, ominously patrolling around the outside there. And always important to make sure you're just taking it alone here because it will just be putting out substantial damage, even if you are pulling it by itself here. 25 fortified situation means that you will be getting at least two of the focus destructions going out from it, maybe a third, depending on what you're going to be uh, doing with your DPSs here. There will be just an incredible amount of damage here that will be going out. It'll be interesting to see if they're going to be able to just focus as much healing as possible to survive it. And both teams just so neck and neck. Gazer Axe has pulled an eye for an eye between both teams as some of the extra trash is grouped up on top of Gazer Axe. Two more scavengers, so just a bit of more of a dangerous pull here for Shells. Method and A dealing solo with Gazer Axe, doing well to turn around for his AoE, and of course you don't want to get caught in that green swirly as the tank. It does a, a substantial amount of damage. You can say a substantial amount of damage, and always important to know where the tank is going to be positioning themselves at, making sure there's consistency for the melee to be able to sit in there. You were seeing Siri using his Devotion Ore for the first one here, maybe looking at having the wings going after the second one as Gazer Axe has the focus destruction, which deals incredible amounts of damage to the entire group here, and it's always important to make sure you're just watching out for that as you're quickly turning and then topping people off as best as you can here. I believe you are also going to be seeing just a full drain and full trank coming out for JB to be able to do whatever he can to make sure everybody is staying alive. And of course getting some of that support from the consumption for the blood DK as well, helping out with that leech. We do see Thrash Bite, uh, Thrash Bite this time, yes, uh, finally spawned <laughs> down over uh, on the Method NA side. They immediately pull him, having to watch out for this big circle that we're about to see in a moment. If you get caught in that, you will pretty much be killed immediately. And if you're not, you'll be punted quite far away. Moving out of that, just taking some of the residual damage, and of course, Jack, the main mechanic in this boss that we really have to focus on is that fixate. Yep, and very important to make sure you're using any kind of immunities if you have them available, like Blessing of Protection as well. The difference for them is really that Sierra is going to be able to have Blessing of Protection you put onto another player, whereas JB uh, unfortunately does not. So you're going to be having people just running into the bookcases every time on the side of Method NA, whereas you'll be able to see if Sierra actually has it available or if they want to actually end up using it uh, to be able to deal with them, because the books can't, aren't too bad, especially when you're able to instantly shut them down with a Solar Beam here and seeing where you're going to be needing the Blessing of Protection coming up next. Yeah, Solar Beam quite advantageous in this situation for Shell's Angels as they deal with that first bookshelf, making sure they get out of that swirly right after. 38% for Thrash Bite on Method and A side. Ahead just a bit, there's a 3% trash difference between the two teams, and of course we saw that one death. Battle Reses will be coming up and recharging in about a minute here, uh, 45 seconds or so, but the big pull after this boss is what we mentioned earlier. This is where we're going to hold our breath and see how well these two teams perform here with the bolstering, making sure that they're killing enough trash. Yeah, making sure that they're able to avoid any of the extra stacks that are coming out to them. And again, be interesting on the side of Shell's Angels here, especially because they do not have that little bit of extra, like, banishes, for example, that Marvin will be able to have access to. Uh, really looking for how they're going to be able to make up for this, because at this point, with how far they've gotten, 
all the trash going forward they're basically going to be having to deal with, uh, or they're going to have to be fighting other trash, like the Orb Caster, for example, which does give percent, which is also going to pull enforcers, which do not, which will be forcing them just to take so much extra time if they miss out on any additional percentage here. We do see that Vanish come down right away. Ursula's Vortex is down. Another Typhoon comes down from JB as they scramble to kill all the remaining trash as evenly as possible. Don't want too many bolster stacks. Excellent job here by Method NA. They still have a bit of time to cleave down the remainder of them. These are quite, quite large imps right now on the screen, filling up the entirety of the camera. They grip the low health one. They know they don't have any chance on the one right in front of the screen here. Just too high health. Opting to finish that last one, getting them to about 85-84% if they manage to do it. Should be enough as they still have some of the scavengers downstairs. Should put them at the correct trash percentage. Shells Angels here following suit and working what they can. Yeah, and, and by being able to pick up that last scavenger here, you are seeing the bloodlust coming out on the side of Shells Angels here, just like last time. But again, making sure they're able to focus these down and even, you know, expending bloodlust here at the expense of maybe only having it at the very, very end of the fight, depending on timing there. They're just trying to be able to get whatever they can to be able to take it down here. The scavengers do look like they got a couple bolster stacks, but not too many, and it's kind of a testament to Divine's ability to make sure he's keeping the, all those scavengers as far away as possible to try to outrange any of the bolster stacks. So really good at job here by Shell's Angels, making sure they're getting really ahead on trash percent. Both teams just crushing it right there. The hardest pull of the dungeon for the trash. One of the hardest pulls as another one is coming up here with Spider Queen Nalasha. They will be usually stealthing past the Enforcers and the Orb Weaver, but here Shell's Angels actually decides to pull it and cleave them all down. Method and A just dealing with the spiders outside of the area, after which I largely expect that they will invis pot past the two enforcers waiting to root the uh, orb weaver and getting him ready to pull Nalasha. Yeah, very important to know that the gates will actually not open until Nalasha goes down here, so there's a required mob that you have to be dealing with. Unfortunately, when you're pulling the orb casters, you know, it's flanked by two enforcers that do not give any additional percentage here. So at this point, they just have to be able to take it down, be able to get around, uh, you know, these other mobs. And we've seen it in the past with like rogues, for example, being able to sap into a shroud of concealment for the group. But Method NA just stopping to use the invisibility potions to quickly just get into the corner here and start working on Nalasha. Yeah, a bit interesting because Shell's Angels in the past has actually skipped this pack, so I'm curious what the reasoning is to needing to pull it. The Enforcers will be going down here momentarily. They are quite bolstered at the moment. Moving over to the side, you can see Divinefield playing just a bit more defensively, but it's going to cost them a lot of time. Nalasha's already a third through her health for Method and A side. Yeah, and this really shows, you know, when Shell's Angels was taking those larger risks, they were executing quite a bit faster than Method NA. But in this rematch that we've been seeing here, you know, Meth Method NA is kind of sticking to their strat here as you're seeing E Man actually going into his purgatory. Quite a bit of damage is going to be going out onto them. But it Method NA has been sticking to their guns, and it's still been you know, very successful for them. Yeah, that, you know, that perk proc on band name is pretty scary. I mean, these spiders, do we say time and time again, a ton of damage, especially in this 25 fortified setting to the tanks. Those poison stacks are quite lethal. Fortunately, both sides have an abundance of dispels for those poisons, but just got a bit ahead of them over there for Method NA for band name. Chunking down quite a lot, making sure they heal them up, and now they will be kiting these spiders away, making sure that they don't get killed as they help peel off the tank. Not enough. Uh, actually, they might consider doing the wipe and release thing. Not sure if it's worth it for them. A few of the spiders are still at 60% HP with some bolster, though. Yeah, an important note is they've, you know, in the past have actually had everybody wipe up to that. But at this point, Band Name just, again, running up with the rest of the group, they'll be able to actually start up with the RP event here, making sure they just kind of keep their distance as best as they can because there is just quite a bit of damage that will come out from those spiders. And like I said, it is nice being able to have both monks to be able to have those constant dispels onto the tank here when you're dealing with it. But they did an excellent job being able to actually slow and being able to actually just DPS them down so well here and, and not incurring the extra deaths. Shell's Angels are spending so much time here dealing with these spiders. Both teams had to, but they just got set back quite a bit dealing with that Enforcer pack. They're already 100% trash. We know you only need to be at 95% of that trash leading up post Domitrax, which Method NA has just started on, because you get the remaining 5% from the bats that will come down. So perhaps a bit of a misplay or miscalculation on their part, but Method NA has started on Domitrax during the first portals at 90%. It seems like a, just a weird fall cry on the side of Shell's Angels where at this point they decide oh yeah we are, are going to play a little bit safer we are going to adjust our strategies here instead of just addressing what went most wrong with the group was just having you know the little error on the trash right after thrash fight you know right on that difficult pull which was all in their execution here so that's really set them back and while they're not out of it by any means it does show that you know some of the adjustments to their strategies may have been just a little bit too extreme.
uh, perhaps just a bit so they deal with uh, well with the M still shells angels as does method and a making sure that none of those four to five mil casts go through do a ton of damage chaotic energy does come out on the side of shells angels everybody huddles inside of that aegis in the middle making sure not to get that well one shot essentially on the pack moving over now and getting ready for the second set of portals which spawned at 50 percent on dama tracks we'll see them momentarily here great timing by method and a wanting to make sure that chaotic energy gets off before the second portal spawn so they have as much time to deal with the portal guardians and the mistresses that come out before another chaotic energy comes up at 100 energy that's the ideal scenario is making sure you have to deal with as little as possible because if you for example uh band name on the side of method na does not actually have purgatory available to them so if he's going to stay out during the chaotic energy to make sure that the mistresses don't knock back the entire group here you have to make sure you have some incredibly heavy defenses here but you're seeing sierra going down there on the side of shells angels very important to be watching out for any of the little bit extra damage going out there i guess he wasn't quite able to actually get back into the field in time maybe if he was playing a little bit greedier they don't have any other reses left available to them throughout this so at this point very important to make sure they'll be able to take down any of the fell portal guardians here reduce the amount of mistresses that are coming out and being able to actually quickly just have them cc'd and taken down the shavara do come out of both portals luckily they managed to kill the guardians before those big fell guards come out banding getting quite low there he still doesn't have the comfort of that purgatory but manages to heal him up as domatrax has hit that soft and rage phase sub 20 percent where he will just essentially deal more damage to the tank as a result of increased attack speed group will be hiding here for that chaotic energy domatrax at 35 percent for shells angels want to make sure those mistresses don't go near the ages during the chaotic energy as they will do that shadow whirl and punt everybody out of there yeah, and it's always important to watch out for that frontal as you're seeing, uh, you know, Divine Field getting punted back there as around the 22%. Method NA clearing up Dama tracks here. They have 5% of the trash coming from the bats right in front of them. Lust is available to them immediately when they pull Mephits Ross, so they're sitting in with two battle res left available. They're looking incredibly powerful going into this. Oh, there was a punt there at the last second. Divine Field barely gets back into the ages as the Shavar that tread across the screen there actually punted all the players while the chaotic energy started so fortunately no deaths over for them method and they looking prime to take this right now still a bit left but they have to kill these four dread wings achieve their 100 percent trash easily here as they're about to fall and then start on a non-tyrannical mephistroth which not the most dangerous boss in the world and the real difficulty will come during the second phase Always important to watch out for any of you know, the the shadows that we've seen. I think Method NA in particular actually let a number of different orbs through the last time we saw them in uh, Cathedral there, which really prolonged the phase for them. And really they're saving grace when we were in this exact matchup here on the 20, I believe it was on the 24 level, was the fact that they actually had poor trash percentage for Shell's Angels. Otherwise, they would have been able to pull ahead. It was a 22-24. We're just splitting hairs here, Jack, which yeah. I don't know nothing about. But <laughs> Mephistroth in this first phase does start at, I believe, 60 energy. So you actually have 50 energy, something like that. So you do actually have exactly 40 seconds before he transitions to the first, second phase. Perfect timing for Bloodlust as we do see Method and A pop that. So we have about 15 seconds left before entering the second phase here for Method and A. We'll see a band named Eman, in this case, pick up the shield, make sure that he's protecting Illidan from all those purple balls. Shell's Angels just now getting started on Mephistroth. Uh, we're just at that phase now, Jack. We're going to have to hope, they're going to have to hope, rather, that Method has some kind of disaster happen in order for them to catch. Yeah, at this point, you know, relying on band name as their goalie, they need to be able to make sure that they're focusing on that. You know, those little things that can actually prolong the phase by another five or ten seconds per uh, orb that actually ends up hitting Illidan can be such a pain and also make it harder as the uh, shadows of uh, Mephistroth continue to spawn throughout the fight here. Very important to watch out for that as Shell's Angels, again, does not have Bloodlust left available to them. You know, we're seeing you know, Method NA doing a great job being able to quickly DPS it down. And another small factor as well is the fact that there's only one range player on the side of Shell's Angels in Doru where, you know, the, the second of the Demon Spikes can actually go and target anybody. Thankfully, for example, it's targeting the healer, uh, so it's not going to displace, for example, any of the other melee here but when you're having you know, the rest of druid and the warlock on the side of method na it makes it so much easier to predict where this, the uh, pillars are going to go well defended there by band name showing uh, the spirit of the world cup if you will as he <laughs> makes sure none of those balls hit illidan in the face mephistroth now at 48 percent this should be easily able to clean it up in this phase as he does start his energy count at zero once he gets out of the second phase so unless something goes horribly wrong they should be able to finish off this game and take it 1-0 but shell's angels not giving up they're certainly still holding their own in the second Second phase doing well to protect Illidan here. We see some of that rogue immunity come in as uh, as the rogue ends up soaking some of the balls for them. Mephistroth does come back up, but 23% for Method right now. Yeah, 60% on the side of Shell's Angels, and again, another minute and a half 
or so before they end up getting Bloodlust available to them. Method NA looking so strong into this 15% remaining onto Mephit's Roth. Again, you're having that nice positioning by JB and Marv standing further away from each other on either side of the room. Then they'll be able to collapse into the center for healing, make sure they're going to be able to stay topped off here. And even a couple times we've seen JB just hopping into bear form to make sure he's playing as safe as they possibly can. They're about to get their third battle res left available to them, but they don't want to take any risks as they're stealing out game one. And I mean, I, that just does it such a clean run from them. They only had that one hiccup, really, with uh, Mitt at the beginning of the map. I think only two deaths off what they should have been. JB, of course, fell upstairs, so only four of those six deaths were intentional. But just really clean run from them, close for both sides, but big advantage now to Method NA winning that first game. Method indeed taking that first map, and uh, we've talked all series, really all tournament long about their play style and how consistent it's been. They're not a team that's prone to wiping a whole lot. They're not a team that's necessarily prone to, or prone to too many careless deaths over the course of a match, and really showing it here, executing their game plan, taking an early advantage here against Shell's Angels. I really like being able to see, you know, how Method has stuck to their guns on it, you know, going from 23 to 25 throughout this, but it also is kind of surprising that Shell's Angels, you know, did, did seem to start editing their strategy, it did start, you know, trying to look internally on it, and while I really applauded it when we were seeing how they adjusted for Vault of the Wardens here. I think they just kind of changed a, a few things around too much for the Cathedral that really just kind of hurt them more than it helped. It was definitely uncharacteristic, I believe, from what we've seen of Shells. It was very uh, not efficient at points, right? We certainly saw some moments where uh, it just felt very uncharacteristic of, of what their identity has been thus far in the tournament. Certainly, though, uh, the advantage of a best of five is that you get more time to kind of right the ship here, and uh, I definitely think it's a little early to start counting out Shell's Angels just yet, but don't go anywhere. When we return, map number two in the grand finals of the Mythic Dungeon Invitational Global Land Finals.
Method NA taking an early advantage in this grand finals. Shell's Angels there, uh, you know, looking like they got a little bit of extra credit on the trash, but unfortunately, this is not most classes you'll have taken. There is no such thing. That's 100 or bust. Uh, Sours, watching off from the side, what did you see about their route that just didn't really seem to come together? You know, the route's really cool. So these guys start the dungeon with pre-lusting uh, before they do the very first trash pull. That way they have a better timing for doing the uh, the trash after um, the smash by boss. Without the bloodlust, their team is not able to uh, uh, to get that trash percentage there. Uh, but then they opted to not invis past the orb weavers. And there was also another skip they missed where you can despawn some of the spiders in the final staircase. And it was those two things that ultimately, I believe, cost them this first dungeon. Right, we were talking, I mean, if trash percentage had gone up above 100, we probably would have been looking about 110, 112. So obviously it's not what you're looking to hit there. And uh, Method NA, you know, I, I feel like a lot of times we were kind of quiet about how their approach works, but uh, it's very steady. It's very steady. It, it's certainly above average speed, and uh, we see it there. They, they did exactly what they needed to do, and they, they got a quick win there. So Method NA's style uh, proving early. Well, it's also interesting, as you, as you mentioned uh, on, on the side of Sours, the fact that they needed to have Bloodlust available to be able to actually deal with the imps after thrash fight i think really hurts uh shell's angels because method na didn't even need to use that they were able to actually have the necessary aoe with the double monks to be able to annihilate those without bloodlust available to them then they're able to use you know lust onto the boss for methods rough well if you're enjoying all the festivities this weekend if you're enjoying watching all this mythic plus action it is welcome back weekend for world of warcraft Feel free to jump in if you have an account, if you have a sub that's prior lapsed, it is now active. Get in there, I believe, till the end of today. So you can get in there and uh, check out some of the stuff as we head, obviously, towards uh, Battle for Azeroth. And uh, yeah, as you said, this is an interesting point that we've kind of seen develop over the course of this weekend. When it's when do you use that Lust? And uh, most of the players on site have been very adamant that the Lust is best suited uh, for that scavenger pull, obviously, uh, after uh, Glazer in that specific library room, to make sure that you're, you're actually getting the maximum amount of trash before those scavengers uh, pass into the portal. And, and, you know, no surprise to see a Volt of the Wardens here, Jack. I know you were particularly out about this dungeon, but, I mean, this is just Shell's Angels' home. This is their territory. This is where they feel most comfortable with. You know, the worry for me is we have seen them fail that big pull uh, in, a, in a 25 setting, in a 24 setting, so we're going to have to see if they're able to pull it off. Yeah, and we... But the nicest thing about it is that we have seen them pull it off in the 25, the most recently, you know, not even that long ago to it. And the discipline that they had in making sure Harrow just stood outside, waited for, you know, dropped the stun early, then immediately got out and just kind of bided his time until it was right to be able to do it. And if anything, to be able to get back into the game in a best of five, this is the nine volt batter that they really need. Yeah, you know, I like to see maybe them uh, change up their first pull a little bit. I've been talking with Luffy and some of the other players where uh, there, there are ways to make up kill count without doing this insane first pull. They do have the rogue available. They can pull some of the uh, dogs on the second boss and handle that to get additional single target. Um, you know, there's so much banking on this massive pull at the start of the dungeon that can be rerouted around. If they're able to pull it off again, I feel like they're like 50-50 on this pool so far, then their time in here is just so incredibly fast. The the stealth from the rogue saves you an, so much time in here and everything else that's possible in here. So we'll have to see if they can do it again. Uh, it is worth noting that every time I've passed by Method NA when they were in the back in that practice area, we have seen them practicing Vault of the Wardens. They understand this is the map they're going to be tested on. And again, if they're looking to wrap up the series, uh, winning this would give them a huge edge obviously as this is very much a shells angels favored map again score 1-0 in favor of method na shells angels need to make some moves Jack, i'm so proud of you for that nine volt battery <laughs> joke you're coming I'm, I'm, to your own I'm, I'm so thankful dad putting it all onto the line on the side of shells angels here is this is what we really want to be able to see is how well they're going to be able to execute the hyper aggressive pull they're going to be able to have divine field as we have the spotlight on him going over the right side and looping around meeting up with his good buddy zira making sure they're getting everything in together focus is going to be then on to hero making sure he's able to survive it getting in getting that stun off after the solar beam goes off then being able to dive in and just put out a huge amount of damage here also watching his position you're seeing the shine getting knocked back knocked around he still has of course his cheat death left available to them we're gonna be watching for the group stun go out and then hero just spike super hard on the meters here yeah so hero here he goes right now getting his damage rolling trying to finish off the rest of these mods a much more modest pull for a method and a if i'm not mistaken on their side on the smaller screen so they will have a bit more
more to deal with here, but quite clean from them so far, but also clean from Shell's Angels. Now, in the last time, we did see them have a couple of slip-up deaths just at the very end of uh, Glaviana, who hits extremely hard. She does get that Metamorphosis buff at uh, under 50%, increasing her damage done. Plus, we have the Fortified on top of it. So those multipliers together just do an immense amount of damage, even though the rest of the trash is dead. Certainly don't want to be hitting those uh, Void Zones on the ground either. Yeah, and it's great for them to avoid them as you're seeing Divine just running for his life to be able to just drop off the rest of his necrotic stacks. An incredibly good execution on the side of Shell's Angels here, taking down another 10%, maybe leaving a little bit over 10% uh, of trash more so than Method NA here, which will also open up the possibility for them to be able to skip past a lot of the extra trash here and get uh, really get the ball rolling. So we did see that LOH, the Leon Hands, come out of the Paladin there as a second Forbearance wears off for Divine Field, who has procced his Purgatory, dealing with just a smaller pull here uh, for some of these candle holders or the scavengers, if you will, making sure they kill them off before they stealth through. Band name dipping really low already at 1%. Marv chunking too. Band name does go down. He will have to res at the front. Coach Mitt going down as well. An absolute disaster of a pull here at the start. One of these casts is going to go off and finish off the rest of the group in just a moment as the rest of the trash ends up resetting. Method will have the full wipe and start at the beginning of the dungeon. Yeah, really scary to see, you know, that pull going out to it while Shell's Angels is just able to grab, you know, these last two mobs leading right up to the boss here. And they also just the way that they chose to pick mobs and how they actually were choosing to play aggressive with these really shows that, you know, Shell's Angels really has this strategy down pat. They chose to skip past a lot of the mobs that really require a lot more babysitting, if you will. They, re they require a lot more stuns, a lot more interrupts, a lot more displacement to make sure they're getting rid of any of those larger blasts or the I-beams coming out from those mobs leading up to Tirathon here. So, phenomenal execution on the shot of Shell's Angels, who's already taken an incredibly early lead. I certainly know what it's like babysitting. I have to do it every day with you, Jack. <laughs> Tirathon getting kited to the front of the dungeon while the Myrmid Dawn and the Infestor are kited along. Extra damage for Ashine here in Ashian in this moment uh, because the rogue benefiting, of course, from that AoE into single target damage on Terrathon. They will get them down quickly. Gehera takes a bit of damage there, spikes down, but nothing too dangerous. Want to make sure you're avoiding that deafening screech frontal that Ashian actually gets hit by Doru as well. Quite lethal on top of the boss. I wish they would listen to you as well as I listen to you, Dad. But they're doing a great job making sure they're getting all of these down. Of course, those mobs will die eventually, to, of course, to the Starfall from the Boomkin, but once they are, do end up dying here, you're going to be able to have any of the Fell Furies that the boss will naturally be spawning to continue to buff up the rogue's damage. So there's quite a great amount of single target, uh, you know, ramp up going out of him, the sustained damage out of Ashine as they keep on getting more Furies in. And you certainly don't want the trash uh, to live too long because the Fell Furies are coming out as well. It's going to really put a lot of strain on the tank with those stacking necrotic buffs. You can only run so far from this boss before he'll catch up to you. We do see a bit of a taunt trade there between Syra and Divinefield. Very well done by them. Unfortunately, Divinefield does not managed to get his active mitigation up by the time the boss returns, procking that absorb shield as Dark Strikes was uh, on on uh, was buffed on the boss, which uh, just a little bit more health to chew through, but so far quite flawless from them. Method and A not too far behind, though, only 30% on the boss, uh, behind on the boss. It's not too far behind in it, but I love the execution there out of that taunt swap there. We, we were talking about how we, they were going to be best able to drop those necrotic stacks, and having that quick motion there by Zero, just make sure he's getting out of the way of the group. You are seeing as uh, Tirithon is going into his Havoc form there, the stack damage going out. Uh, Zira already doing whatever he can to start casting onto his, uh, you know, Devotion Aura. He actually ends up bubbling so he can keep on casting, keep on healing when he does get hit by that hatred there. Make sure that he's going to be staying in range. And at this point, he's trying to add as much damage as, as possible to get out of this phase as quickly as you can because there is such a high ramping amount, even on a 25 fortified situation. A lot of pulsing damage coming out of Terrathon right now as he hits the single digits of percent over for Shell's Angels on the main screen. Method and A still kind of chiseling away, but they've fallen even further behind, likely due to the second round of cooldowns coming up for Shell's Angels, those two minutes. This boss does take a while, of course, as you said, Jack, even in this fortified setting. They do manage to down him and will be moving over to the Imps and the Imp Mother. Now, these Imps, there's a lot of them, and all of them apply necrotic to the tank, so you've got to move really quickly here. You have a small window of opportunity before the tank just gets gibbed. Yeah, and they do a great job making sure free AMSs as he grabs everything in together here. Was a bit worried because Zira actually didn't have his Divine Shield available to him, how well he'd be able to get everything in. But he does an excellent job quickly sweeping up everything and bringing it into Divine the way they'll be able to actually just have the better focus onto the tank here. He does a great job actually avoiding most, if not all, of the necrotic stacks as he's going into this, and he's almost getting Purgatory back off cooldown. Yeah, really smart death grip or uh, Gorfin's grabs there to the side, about 15, 20 yards away from the tank. That way the imps, even once they start moving slowly, they're not mailing the tank at 
adding some of those necrotic stacks on top of the ones that he's already accruing for the imp mother but really excellent pull here by them method and a at six percent ready to do their own imp pull in just a moment yep. yep just a few percent left onto it as shells angels taking down that imp mother at 74 percent in terms of trash percentage done and they are able to catch the elevator at an opportune time here ready to move on immediately onto inquisitor here as method and a is still lagging a little bit behind Getting ready to pull Inquisitor here. Everyone's favorite boss, of course. Uh, new subjects have arrived. Some of the Defilers are pulled from the side. Now, a couple of these have some drain stuns as well. The Scorcher is the one that you want to watch out for as it will explode when it dies for a pretty substantial amount of damage. Solar Beam goes down. They want to get as much damage out as possible quickly onto these to make sure that, once again, not too many Necrotic Stacks get down on Divine Field as he will just have nowhere to run and heal until 70% when Inquisitor Tormentum ports to one of the jails. I'm really looking to see the target focuses we're seeing here with the Scorchers getting lower and lower. Previously, we had seen, all right, excellent job here. Make sure they have the focus onto the Scorchers. Previously, we had seen Eshine, of course, actually proccing his uh, cheat death very early on onto the boss fight here because they actually killed him in really close uh, quarters to each other here. So they just have a little bit of percent left to finish off the rest of the Defilers here. And they did a good only pulling one of the uh, Scorchers at that point making sure they have a little bit more free reign to be able to get that down quickly and then they're able to have all the trash down before they enter the first of the prisons with the demons the targeted dps really is shining from the rogue right now as they move <laughs> over to the jail now the annihilator does drop aggro and will charge a random range target stunning them in the process the warlock is the one you want to watch out for the seeds are well interrupted there the one i was going to mention as it will do just a lethal amount of damage to the group wanting to group them up get as much damage as possible and you can see that divine field is kiting slowly away from the casters because once they are in interrupted and unable to spell cast they will default to meleeing the tank if he's out of range they won't get any necrotic stacks and everyone can continue happy one shadow bolt does go off chunks divine field just a bit but he's only at six stacks right now so it shouldn't be too dangerous yeah at this point he's easily able to kind of top himself off here zero unfortunately just has to deal with a curse going out from the demon there as they're just moving on to of course the old god pack which is going to be on the other side of you know the little hole that they have to cross here always important to watch out for any of those tormenting orbs because you have to be facing again or facing the orbs as they go out otherwise you will be receiving a little bit of a disorder Orient effect, which can just be a very big pain to deal with here. And of course, waiting for that teleport where the Tormentum will then go immune as he's breaking out the next set of prisoners. Excellent opportunity for the tanks to reset their necrotic during that port as Tormentum does his own port for Method and A at that 70% phase, uh, reaching that first uh, kind of orc pack that we saw with the Annihilator on their side. Tormentum now at 33%, dropping rapidly as we see that beam come down to make sure that you silence some of those dangerous old god casters on Shell's Angel side. Yeah, and the, at this point, usually you are seeing, you know, the world. Or the, the orc pack just being a lot more deadly, having to watch out for a lot more of the stu stuns and CCs onto the Warlocks or the Annihilator, which will be charging up against you. So at this point, you know, they're getting down to 17% on the side of Shell's Angels, doing a fantastic job being able to keep everything in together. And also one of the focuses is because you have to constantly be facing any of the tormenting orbs. You are seeing, you know, Doru as well as the rest of the melee always trying to position themselves so they're facing into the middle of the room here and positioning themselves. That way they'll be able to pull the first of the mini bosses guarding, uh, you know, the third and fourth boss. Really well done by them. Shell's Angels doing what they do best in this dungeon absolutely destroying it method na certainly holding their own as they're about to hit the second port going over to that old god area just a bit behind of course because of that white but they're still keeping that gap the same size they're not falling further and further behind so at any moment if shells angel slips up method na will be right on their tail to grab that beam comes down of course there are two scorchers and two defilers in this back a lot of damage is going to be coming out here jack yep they do a great as you're able to see the the target focus on the skull onto the scorcher there making sure they're getting it down immediately here. You might end up seeing if uh, Sierra was play extremely safe. It probably shouldn't be too necessary to be able to use Devotion Aura if need be, if they're getting down close together here. But he's just going to default and be holding it on, probably for Glazer if need be, as you're going to be able to deal with any of the extra explosions going out to this. And again, that's consistent kiting going out. He will be able to have a, quite a bit of room uh, in this in Tormentum's area to be able to just start kiting out any of the uh, the Shavara here, drop his necrotic stacks, and then be able to get back in as they're getting that last Scorcher down. We do see Divine Field, of course, pedaling harder than Jack does on his tricycle getting ready to move away from Ileana who is a substantial amount of HP she is stunnable though so we do see a combination of that asphyxiate along with the AMS coming down making sure that he can clean up those necrotic stacks as they will start to head over to uh, our good friend uh, Glazer which I believe is an eyeball boss I love eyeball bosses did you know that yes <laughs> going into it they are just making sure they're getting that 95% trash remaining here so they're doing an excellent job here I believe previously we would actually seen them be a little bit higher in terms of trash percentage and they still needed to deal with the Brood Mother and the Spirit of Vengeance at the very end here. So no expectations to see any more trash coming out of them as they're going to be dealing with Glazer here. Method NA, again, getting Tormentum down, dealing with the mini boss here. Still just a little bit of that gap. And like you mentioned, they haven't quite been able to close it.
it, but they're not even falling further behind. I like seeing the Scorcher here for Shell's Angels, getting some of those procs as long as they keep it locked down going. It does get one Inferno Blast off, so but it did seem intentional for them to drag it along. Wanted to make sure that they get some of the Cephas procs and what have you. We're likely will finish it off during this Energize phase where the bots will become 99% resistant to damage. Want to make sure that you're reflecting the beam all along these mirrors that will eventually bounce right back into Glazer's butt, shattering the shield and causing him to take 100% increased damage for those 12 seconds. Yeah, but I like the positioning of Zira as you're seeing him staying close to the shell uh, of Glazer here, making sure that a lot of the extra orbs around him are going to be just going into the shield rather than at him, because any, of course, of the extra balls going around will target the nearest player and be able to bounce back towards them. At this point, they have the vulnerability phase where they have a small window to be able to burn as much damage as possible. And like you said, having the Scorcher there is so so advantageous to have those Cephas procs, but you are seeing Divine Field actually procking his Purgatory, and a couple people dropping a little low here. Yeah, to squint there and see that, it caused a bit of eye strain, but Divine Field <laughs> does proc his Purgatory there. Glazer's still quite stable right now at 28% for those two teams. Method having just downed it, getting up Dark as well, another death on the board for them, working their way towards Glazer as well, but Shell's, Shell's Angel's looking prime to hopefully finish this before the next Energize phase. Yeah, and they always have to watch out of trying to get the Scorcher down before they go into that phase because it does release that large burst. You've seen a shine dropping low, but he does not proc his cheat death here. So important to get that uh, get the boss down, or sorry, get the ad down quickly before you actually start another intermission phase. It looks like they'll be kind of close to hitting it here because they do have a very limited window to be able to get it down quickly here as they haven't been able to get all of those blue orbs into the boss quickly. But they do a great job actually being able to finish it off here and move on to Ashkel. The eyeball boss does go down. Cordana's gonna have to look in her contacts and get some extra bosses in here to make sure that they do what they can to stop this progressing shells angels as they run over to Ashkolm, our resident molten giant boss who's currently in encased in a tomb of ice. Yep, right here, and you're seeing Method NA hitting that transition point at 69% here. Very nice of them to be able to start moving the rest of these mirrors here, get the eyeballs redirected back into it, and it'll be able to see what they can do once they end up hitting that vulnerability phase here. But at this point, Shell's Angels is looking to extend their lead, popping Bloodlust immediately on Ash Golem. And no surprise here because they will be able to get him to that brittle phase again as soon as those statues are clicked on the side. You can already see the interaction has happened during this phase, of course. Brittle for 20 seconds. The boss will take, if I'm not mistaken, 25% increased damage. So lots of damage coming in right now for Shell's Angels. His heart is cold as ice, Jack, and he is willing to sacrifice. I don't think he'd be willing to sacrifice for Cordana here, but Sierra is just ready to completely sacrifice having to do any healing here. Just start focusing as hard as he can onto the DPS. Not too far off from Doru's DPS. Yes, as he tried to do whatever he can to outpace him here. Incredible single target there by Sarah. Yikes, Arena from <laughs> me right there. Huge amounts of damage as Sarah is now forced to resume some healing. We see some of the pre-AMS by Divine Field to pick up some of those Molten Slag on the ground. If those touch any of the Fire Elemental adds that will spawn, it will cause them to, of course, enrage and explode for a substantial amount of damage on the group. Great AMS there. He picks up the remainder of them, as many of them as he can. Of course, the Rogue has access to that, uh, the, the Cloak of Shadows as well, in order to clean some of those up. Very clean platform here and should be able to deal with it. Interesting. I think uh, Hero actually just... Uh, rolled right off the uh, the edge of there, so he actually does have his chili uh, debuff onto him, which substantially reduces the haste that he will be able to have access to. So thankfully, they're not in the vulnerability phase when he gets that, but it looks like a little bit of a side misplay that's really going to reduce his damage here. Yeah, maybe he was just doing it for fun because they're just doing so well right now, but indeed, he does finally fall off. They're about to enter the second brittle phase right now as Method Rene is currently finishing up with theirs in just a moment. About halfway through, things will then heat up for them as the Molten Giant will break out of that ice. 15% on Ashkelon for Shell's Angels. Looking at to finish off with this extra damage, of course, it will freeze everything, all enemies in the room, including those small embers on the side. Right, and very important, be make sure that if you're not going to be able to get out of the, uh, the phase quick enough, or you have to be dealing with the embers afterwards, try to get whatever kind of damage you can. But at this point, they're just able to focus down the boss and start moving on here. 97% of trash remaining here. They will be able to get the Strata Consumant out, as well as the Distract out onto this Dreadlord here, moving past it, and then be able to start skipping past the Jailer big double skip here coming from Shell's Angels, as you said. They only have that 3% left, so if they pull everything off correctly in the kind of dark area of the dungeon, they should only have to deal with uh, the Witch, of course, and then finally the uh, Shade right before the final door. Method and A has as well popped their Bloodlust on Ash Golem, 33% on the board for them. Working to clean up some of those zones, but not as much as Shell's Angels is banking that they're not going to have too many of those embers spawn. Fortunate spawn for them there as it spawns right under the boss, being able to be cleaved down. All of Shell's Angels hurried down with their Avalanche Potions, and do well to miss the elevator. Yeah, but it, they actually did end up hitting up against the elevator as it came upstairs, but if you're able to run against the elevator there, you are able to actually just go through the
through the floor and then hit your avalanche potion once again. Like being able to see Doru grab, of course, the uh, the light there that they're going to be able to just toss again to the rest of the group here. You are seeing Harrow going down. I believe he's just running into that trash pad. They should be able to actually get the res out onto him, but you are seeing Doru also going down. He's dropping the pylon for himself. They will be able to start transporting the light just ahead of them and start throwing it just ahead for them to be able to deal with. But it looks like he just didn't quite have uh, the cooldown left or available to them on his uh, on his invisibility potion. He kind of got burned there. Yeah, this uh, this cave certainly being an arachnophobiac's nightmare as they kind of move around the side. They do have the light with them. They'll pop that uh, mass res in just a moment. I think they didn't have to release. Yeah, we see them up there right now. They're running down with their invis. They'll join their teammates on the other side, preparing to pull the last two trash mobs of the dungeon. Of course, once those doors open, we'll likely see Syrah running over, starting the RP on Cordana while the rest of the group finishes up. Another death on Hera, unfortunately. Not the cleanest we've seen them do this dark era, but they certainly have such a dominant lead right now that it should be all right. Uh, uh, Method and needing to do a more uh, traditional skip, but not as clean, not having access to that mass stealth on the rogue. Band name as a result needs to pull the Jailer to the side. Rest of the team runs through safely, and he has to sacrifice himself and get resed on the other side. That's the interesting thing when we're looking at the different compositions and the advantages you're going to be able to get out of them is that, you know, the rogue can provide so many nice effects to it where, like you said, not, a, not having to actually just sacrifice your tank to be able to run by, being able to skip past certain trash mobs goes a very long way for it. And at this point, Shells Angels' gates are open to Cordana. Zero is running ahead to be able to start the, the RP event for for that while the rest of the group takes care of the Broodmother here and they're looking to a prime position to be able to take back this game and get back into the series. Broodmother being killed off here as they get ready to cross that bridge. Method and A just now starting their uh, Dark Portal era. Getting a summon on the other side for I believe uh, Mitt if I'm not mistaken. JB does go down. Hopefully they have the light that they're going to be able to toss over. JB will likely re-stealth and throw the light over if it's not already there. I don't see it on the screen right now. Shells Angels has Cordana primed and ready and are preparing to pull the final boss of the dungeon and to try and tie up the series. Yep, right now go Going into Cordana, important to make sure you're watching out for the the, uh, the light orb that's sitting right behind her on the boss. Important that they actually don't have anybody holding on to it at this point. You will be able to grab it and use your extra action button to throw it around. But at the very beginning of the fight, uh, one of her avatars will end up stealing the orb. You must kill it as she does disappear into the shadows here. And then once you kill that avatar, you will be then able to get the orb again and then be able to find her and continue out through this phase. So yeah, here we go with the Avatar right now. We see that immediate uh, Hammer of Justice come down, stunning the Avatar for six seconds, getting as much damage as possible to reveal that light. We'll see an instant throw from the light right onto Cordana, who fortunately was quite nearby for the team. And we do, of course, know that these Void Zones spawn uh, two nearby players and then two in the opposite corners of the room. So if you stack near one of the corners, or certainly at least stack together, you will eliminate most of those Void Zones quite early. Yeah, and very good job. Make sure they're actually having Doru holding on to it. That way, Zero will be able to continue pumping out some extra damage here. And having that extra focus to make sure that, you know, even when he's in his Starfall, he's able to start casting on the move here, making his life a lot easier and not actually ending up losing any kind of extra DPS along the way as we're going into this 50% mark. They will start having the little maze effect with the walls start coming out very, very soon. Dory, of course, uh, uh, keeping this pa uh, platform cleaner than I do with my head. Jack is as nicely quite safe. <laughs> they move over to the corner, though. They're hoping to get those out of the way right before these walls spawn in just a moment here. Uh, but unfortunately, if luck does not favor them. They're forced to the far side. They have to deal with this dodge first, which will allow those void zones to kind of grow, perhaps out of control. Now, they do grow to a maximum size of about a third of the platform. Shouldn't affect the bottom right corner on the screen right now, which is the important corner where the boss is going to go and that second avatar will spawn. Yeah, at this point, they're able to just stay together as a group, make sure that they're going to be watching out for where the next maze is going to be spawning here. And they will actually be able to, you know, jump into this corner here where all the extra damage is. And if you're watching, the rest of the group is doing a great job actually edging through and making sure they're standing right outside of the shadow before they actually have to dive in, standing in the shadow as only as much as they actually have to and reducing the damage that they're going to be able to take. Then as you're seeing Doru just kind of taking as much time as he needs to be able to take out the rest of the shadow before, of course, he has to throw the orb onto the Avatar of Vengeance, reveal it, CC it, and then be able to go right back onto Cordana. Yeah, you definitely want to stand, uh, been max standing on the edge here, especially when you have so, a lot of those void zones invading the area that you need to run to to DPS Cordana. Quickly eliminated there as that Avatar of Vengeance just CC it. As soon as that CC comes up, as I said, Jack, the immunity bubble from Cordana fades was now at 9% for Shell's Angels and only three deaths on the board for them. So once again, I mean, they just, they have <laughs> minimized the quality of this map and the quality of runs that they do and they tie the series one apiece as uh, was perhaps to be expected. Yeah, water is wet, uh, Rich is poorly dressed, <laughs> Shell's Angels wins Vault of the Wardens. They obviously had that one hiccup at the very beginning yesterday, but otherwise, uh, in terms of consistency, which we really come to laud over the course of this tournament, this is really their map. 
Uh, they know exactly that they wanted to go there. It's no surprise it came out as their first counter pick. Obviously, they are going to have the opportunity to have multiple counter picks, but just get this out of the way, get the win on the board, and uh, get that confidence back. Let uh, Method know, hey, we're in this series too. Yeah, and it, being able to see you know a dungeon that they just executed maybe an hour or two ago, you know, it really shows that they're saying, okay, we've already done this once. You know, today we we're moving on from our mistakes earlier in the weekend. And we want to make sure that we're able to just go out with a statement here and be able to say we are going to be in this. We are going to be able to take you the distance. All right. Well, Thai series. When we return, it's down to essentially a best of three. Don't go anywhere. We will have a finals champion not too far from now. This final battle between North America and Europe all tied up now. And uh, I got to say, as much as Shell's Angels took that one, uh, Sours, it looked like Method and A was kind of right there aside from that early wipe. Yeah, you know, extremely close dungeon out of these guys. Their time in here was very good. Uh, Shell's Angels did end up going a minute and a half faster than Method and A was able to go just yesterday. Uh, but despite that huge setback in the beginning of the dungeon, it's very, very close to route it. This, you know, their comp is doing so much damage. They're able to stay on the heels of them the entire time. It shows just how important that one mistake is. Here we're going to take a look at it again. We see that perhaps just not enough available uh, for band name. JB taking a nice leap, only helping him out at the very end, and band name just falls. Uh, perhaps didn't call for enough defensives. The, the, who knows what goes on? And then once band name is down, everything starts to fall apart. Uh, a res comes out, but it's too late. Uh, when something like this happens, th there's not a lot you can do to recover. They just have to all die and then reset the whole pool. It sets them back. It sets them back so much time. 
Yeah, and certainly uh, this is something that is skippable with the Rogue, as we did see coming out from Shell's Angel. So uh, at that point, Method NA kind of had to deal with it, didn't quite work out with them. But again, I, I, I think there's reasons to be optimistic for them. And I think over the course of this tournament, we, we maybe see, I think we maybe saw a little bit more of what we felt was a skill gap between these two teams. But it feels like it's right there and just very much neck and neck today. Well, it has been very much neck and neck, but it also kind of reminds me of what PogChamp was kind of talking about before they did end up engaging, uh, you know, with Shell's Angels, is that the highest high of Shell's Angels, you know, almost beats everybody out. But the consistency that they do have is what is what the most concerning, really, when we're watching a lot of these games. So being able to see you know, them play all yesterday and all in today, it really is showing the more they're playing and the more getting onto stage, the better that they keep on performing. Well, it is going to be in Method's hands now what they choose to do here. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we take another uh, nautical nonsense trip to Maw of Souls. Uh, obviously, this did work for the sister team for Method NA. I mean, I, I was just saying the same thing. I really expected us to go to Maw of Souls. Uh, we saw how hard the counter kind of worked against Shells. All right, Shells. Ted. What? You've had that thing for like two months. <laughs> what? What is that? Gentlemen, I present to you the Book of Puns. Wow. 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 I, I, you know, I, the worst part is I feel like uh, probably, probably could have predicted that. <laughs> Uh, but now we know uh, where all of the puns actually come from. So how many how many hours a day would you say you spend studying that? Up to 12, maybe? Uh, on a bad day, I would say 10 if I'm not feeling it, but probably up to 14 hours worth of pun writing. But let's get back to the topic on hand here. Right. Are we going to Mob Souls? Is I, that I, going to be the pick? I think we might. I mean, there was a bit of, uh, you know, suffering for Shell's Angels. Certainly wasn't a map that perhaps they had a, a bit of a hiccup on, but they had quite a big hip out. And uh, we're absolutely wrong. So Upper Karazhan is actually <laughs> yeah. where we're going to be going here I mean, right it's, now. It's worth noting that Mob Souls is not a place place for anyone. It's not like if you go there as Method and A, you're like, wow, this is going to be a great time for us. Obviously, they too have to have practice. And they're choosing to go with Upper Karazhan. Uh, Sowers, what do you make of this pick? It's uh, certainly an interesting pick. Once again, the Rogue uh, plays a lot of... Uh, it, uh, it affects how you pull this dungeon quite a lot. Near the end of the dungeon, uh, Method is going to have to use Invis potions to skip the, the, the trash on the bridge up to the chess event. Whereas, um, if Shell's Angels plays their cards right, they can save their potion cooldown by using the Shroud of Invisibility from the Rogue to get past that trash. I like being able to see the upper Karazhan as well because it has a lot of times been on how big Shell's Angels is able to pull in order to actually get ahead here. And there are a lot of limitations onto upper Karazhan, much like we've seen kind of out of like Seed of the Triumvirate, for example, where Shell's Angels is not able to make a hyper aggressive play like they did at the start of Vault of the Wardens in order to gain a sizable advantage. Same thing in upper Karazhan where you're extremely limited as to what you can do and there's a lot of focus on the boss damage. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, the kind of pull that we saw even at the beginning of the dungeon sours uh, from Method NA was actually to just largely sack their players and have JB res upstairs where they're gonna have actually double action from that shroud coming up with the rogue at the beginning with the spirits. But those dangerous pulls are the ones that we're gonna keep coming back to. Curator's room with all the necrotic and the fortified, and then again, the mana devour the small mana devourers after the main boss. Right, obviously, uh, you know, later half of the dungeon, there's certainly things to be considered, but the very beginning of this dungeon certainly going to set the tone how these teams do with the Trash, Upper Karazhan, Game 3, let's go. Jack, give me my book back. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we are now starting here on Upper Karazhan. So expecting to see a lot of uh, kind of control and dead end saves coming out of both teams. Likely a bit cleaner for Shell's Angels as we immediately see that Shroud come up along with all of the uh, speed from the team going right up the stairs. The uh, Spirit at the top will likely be controlled by Divine Field as he'll drag it over towards the Golems. Yep, very important to watch out for as they're trying to get past the rest of these mobs. You know, like I said, having the control undeads, being able to grab everything in together goes a very long way here. As you're seeing JB just trying to move ahead from the rest of the group here. You're also going to see the Nullifier being pulled in, grabbing everything in together to be able to get into this room here. Always important to watch out for as you have to. You have to make sure the Nullifier, if you can, is going to be able to avoid actually hitting any of the uh, the DPS, or sorry, the tanks or the healers. That way the DPS is just getting the sizable buff. We already see the Forbearance come down on Ashine as he procs his cheat death immediate lay on hands, I would assume, from the healer there. Uh, Sierra, of course, pops his own bubble just to make sure to stay alive. So double forbearance on the board for Shell's Angels. Method and A with a pretty sizable pull. Bandit getting quite low as he kind of kites the rest of them out. Huge disaster here for the side of Shell's Angels. Doru and Ashine both go down. They use their battle res, immediately go down again. They're not getting the interrupts on these arcane barrages. Just so much damage coming out. Heru goes down as well. And they're going to need to hope to uh, stay alive here because they have to res everybody upstairs. They already used their shroud. They did already 
to use their shroud here, but it's crazy with the nullifier here. They need to be able to get far, far enough away that the, that way the pylon will actually res them far away enough to be able to get the res off, not pull the nullifier in the process here. Method NA showing a much cleaner pull here, although they did need to actually mass res a couple of players here, bleeding just both the monks who would actually use the paralysis uh, onto those spirits here, but they're really looking to be in a good position going on a curator. Yeah, I mean, any advantage Method NA had, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Shell's Angels had by having the clean skip with the Rogue has certainly been overcome and beyond at this point. Method NA has now started on Curator, the first boss of the dungeon here, making sure that they stack together to bait the, uh, the electric zones, rather, and of course the volatile energies coming out. As soon as they come out, those will be baited to jump to players, easily allowing the two monks to cleave it down. Yeah, and I like the positioning here at having everybody else more or less stacked together here. It is important to watch out for the quaking that's going to be going out, but at the same time, you know, looking at the different positioning for, of course, any of the electric shocks coming out, you want to make sure that as best as you can, you're kind of building a pocket for the rest of your melee to be able to DPS into, because there can be some situations where you're having, you know, the evocate dropping uh, lightning strikes just before it goes out, which can potentially block out some of your melee here. So band name doing an excellent job building a position from which the melee will be able to co consistently strike. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, just kind of a disaster scenario here for Shell's Angels. This is one of those two really dangerous trash uh, pulls in this dungeon, certainly more than one pack that we were talking about in this fortified setting. Just didn't work out for them in the end. They do move the mob out there, still need to do have that nullifier. And I believe some of the golems and some of the sentries did leak and did not uh, get killed. So, I mean, there should be at about 40% trash. You can see they're missing that 13%. Bloodlust now coming out for the method NA side as that first evocation, 100% increased damage taken for 22nd uh, phase starts for them. That's right. It just shows the monk burst damage that they can be pumping out during that period of time here. Doing a fantastic job. They have about 15 seconds left on to Bloodlust. Actually, 25 seconds left on to Bloodlust here where they'll be able to actually pump out a bunch of extra damage here. Getting out of that Evocate phase, they're at 22% here with a little bit of time left on to Bloodlust to be able to continue to burn down this boss here. Phenomenal focus damage and just huge damage coming out of both monks. Actually, mid, not too far off from Dark. Yeah, I mean, huge damage coming in. They're going to start slowly dragging the boss towards the exit. Always love to see these from the teams. Really been maxing all that movement, of course, you have some uh, not as mobile classes in that blood DK as uh, you would otherwise have unless they have that uh, Sky Step potion available to them, which certainly they won't use just to exit this room. Curious to see how they're going to handle the trash uh, coming up for Shade of Medivh. We have seen two different strats where you pull a bunch of it together with the bats and cleave it down on top of that fell mage, or you just kind of ignore it, move past it, and then, uh, you know, drop some CC on the uh, the fell lord there. But Band Name getting quite low here. A couple of scary spikes there just for a moment. He certainly has at least 10 stacks of that necrotic, making it a fair bit difficult, uh, giving a fair bit of difficulty to heal him. Yeah, at this point, you know, JB is just trying to contribute a huge amount of damage here, but at this point, he is just kind of trying to transition back into getting everybody top off and that's the risk that you have to be able to run is knowing how much damage is going out onto the rest of the group here when you need to actually drop more healing onto mid and to dark here and at that point he was very low onto mana there so at this point he's just doing as much damage as possible pushing them out of that phase there and making sure he's able to get back into it so we do see the bats pulled on top of the fell mage here making sure to soak those orbs we see band name move right in those do have to be soaked until they fully dissipate otherwise they explode for a lethal amount of damage on the group not too dangerous to just sit in them here as most of the bats have been taunted and pulled down so uh, the tank doesn't have too much threat too much to worry about there pyromancer gets a fell fireball off on banding chunking him for about 50 percent hp there nothing he can handle as they fight to kill the rest of the bats here before too many necrotic stacks accrue and we could of course see that blade lord down at the bottom waiting for them yeah but shell's angels here are just about to hit into the evocation phase they're going into uh, one of the last volatile energies that they have to end up killing here bullets has already been popped as they're going to be able to just slowly go into it here they have, you know a very short window of time so it doesn't hurt to actually pop bloodlust early they will still have full duration going into it and this is where you really need to start seeing them getting back into the game here they did see the paralysis go out on the side of dark he needs to be able to paralyze the mob establish aggro onto it and then die to it then jv will be able to get the res out onto him and then the rest of the group will be able to skip by yeah so a largely uh purposeful death there as they filter into shade of medivh's room now we've seen this boss already several times of course three schools of magic the most dangerous being that frost a bite cast want to make sure that's interrupted so that none of the inferno blasts need to be used in order to break somebody out of that ice block and anytime you can avoid any of those Inferno Blasts uh, with a blink or, of course, a disengage, what have you, it's best to do so because it just does a ton of dot damage. And it really shows how well these classes are suited for a boss like Medivh here because everybody will be able to have, you know, the rolls to be able to get out. Or as you see the Transcendence coming out of, on the side of Dark there. He first puts his Transcendence in melee to start the fight. Then he ends up placing his, a new, or say, ends up teleporting while placing a new Transcendence point uh, out there when he dodges the other Flame Bolt there. So great control there, and it puts so much less stress on the healer in the process. And you can see just how well coordinated they are as they start this Guardian's image phase. Uh, Mitt went to one area. We had a uh, band name and, of course, Dark go to the other area. Getting
ready to DPS these right as they spawn, which is why you're seeing two Guardians images die at the same time. Uh, a bit of a, a riskier strat for the healer, as it will take uh, a bit more healing. They will live just a, a bit longer. Or sorry, they, they won't live a bit longer, but you'll have to deal with a lot of that burst damage at the start. You have a longer period of time where three birds are up right. at the exact same moment, and it quickly builds up a lot of stacks to you. But this is the situation that I think JV thrives in. It's he wants to be able to have the extra pressure onto him. That way he'll be able to kind of control it. And as we saw in the interviews a lot of times, you know, he gets in his head where he thinks he's able to do these things. He's going to do whatever he can to start learning and start improving on, on that uh, vision of his. And seeing that, where you're able to actually split up your monks, having them go to opposite sides to be able to get two down at once, it puts a ton of pressure early on, but it has such a great payout as you're seeing them burn through Medivh here. Ben Awell moving out there, piercing missiles, hitting him quite hard here, but nothing that he won't be able to heal through. Another Inferno Blast going down on Bad Name right now. Flame Wreath now coming out on the groups. A lot of damage here on the two players affected, and of course, if anybody dies or walks through those rings, it will essentially wipe the group. So Dark does have an Inferno Blast cast on him, manages to heal through it. No problem for JB to heal through this damage right now. Yeah, and JB's doing an excellent job making sure he's just trying to stay on top of, you know, both Dark and himself and be able to watch out for it. He never even had to really switch into bear form and to be able to actually continue healing himself. He was just able to straight up heal right through it and doing an excellent job kind of pacing themselves through their defensive cooldowns. As you were seeing, Karma was coming up on the side of Dark at the very end of the flame rate duration. Now they're going to be into that ceaseless winter and they're getting the boss down without a, without a hitch. And of course, you see the players jumping up and down here, not out of glee, but rather because the ceaseless winter will do increasing damage per stack the longer you stand still. Not the fa caster's favorite uh, face to deal with, but they fortunately don't have to deal with it for too long as they kind of jump down the rabbit hole here. Yeah, but you're seeing, you know, Shell's Angels, you know, in opposition really to Method NA strategy, they are taking on the Guardian's images one by one here. So it will take them a bit longer, but it is a bit safer from the healer side here. And uh, many times, you know, with a Paladin, you can be a little bit conflicted where Virtue is, you know, many times taken for most dungeons in most situations here. And having to balance and choose between taking Faith uh, in this dungeon versus Virtue to have a little bit better healing for Flame Wreath and more consistent healing for the Guardian's image phase, depending on what you want to go after. But unfortunately, you know, it does put more pressure on your group to be able to be a little bit uh, more focused on of the Guardian's images. And it's really nice to see the rest of Druid, uh, JB's favorite, popped out here. Some Druid representation, Jack. You know, I've had a lot of... Uh, I have a Druid friend as well. Unfortunately, he lost his ID. Now we just call him Drew. Uh, but as uh, they move on here, getting ready to move towards the Mana Devourer boss. Now, a lot of danger on this boss, and they don't have the advantage of a second immunity that you'd rather uh, usually find in a Holy Paladin, or a Rogue in this case. Um, so they only have that one immunity, AMS, on the Mana Devourer. Once they pull him into the corner, they will only be able to do one round of soaks with the Blood Decay after that people will need to try and help out with some CDs and drop those stacks off. Yeah, at this point, you're, they're positioning themselves into the corner. That way, they'll be able to drag the Mana Devourer in, reduce the radius from which all the other Mana Orbs are going to come into. And yeah, like, you're, you're, like you said, you know, it'll be interesting to see where they're going to go in terms of how much they're going to be able to soak up. If they're going to put a ton of pressure on to, say, a band name to soak up all the Orbs, not just the ones with uh, pre-AMS, but also, again, just by himself with using larger defensive cooldowns. Because, of course, while you do soak those Mana Orbs, you get a substantial amount of extra damage, or you get about 5 or 10% uh, extra damage per stack. You just take a substantial amount of damage damage to be able to, and so many times it's so much more stress on the healer to be able to focus heal you, rather than nobody taking the stacks and healer able to focus on more DPS. And you know, wouldn't it be shocked to see kind of Marv grab some of that, uh, those stacks here? I mean, he can keep himself alive through one stack. Maybe not so much the Windwalkers, but they do well here to absorb as many of those stacks as they can right now. No stacks on Band Name to speak of. Boss is still kept in the corner. They have those kind of uh, void zones on the side where can they, they can drop the unstable stacks coming up because the AMS has now been used. So this next round will be kind of needed to be helped by by the rest of the group or perhaps mass CDs from band name without that pre-immune and then he'll need to start dumping some of those off. Yeah, interesting to see he, he is picking up a huge amount of stacks here in the middle of the room here trying to do whatever he can. He hasn't taken two, actually he has taken a ton of stacks seven here. Seven stacks. Seven stacks. He's starting to remove them as quickly as he can here. He probably will be seeing Purgatory popping up very soon here. Two stacks left remaining here. Fighting against not only the Necrotic but also just all the extra damage he has to take. Not actually uh, ending up popping Purgatory. Just an excellent job being able to sustain himself there. And while there is going to be high energy onto the boss right now. By the time they get to the next spew of mana orbs and things like that, they should be fine just to be able to get the AMS back, be able to soak a couple of them as you're seeing Dark helping out uh, band name in the process, just to be able to make sure that the boss is not going to explode. And not as many as you think. The AMS is actually usually off by about three seconds or so. It's just barely shy of 30 seconds. So it's orb spawning, which is why you see another seven stacks on band name right now. Dark does go down. Band name does proc that perg. Fortunately, it was a low enough percent on the boss that they didn't have a disastrous wipe. They finally 
down the boss. They will be able to res at this new checkpoint as soon as we see them grow in size. Here we go. And now the next dangerous pull, the smaller mana devourers. There's 15 of these in the room. Oftentimes you'll see everybody group them up. Band name will hopefully pre-pop AMS if it's available to him. Didn't see if he used it that second time there. And we'll start cutting these down to hall. Not only is it tough for the tank to stay alive here, but everybody needs to make sure they chip in on those orb soaks. Yeah, very important to see. Uh, I, like you said, I, he did actually hold on to the AMS, I believe, there. That way he'd yep. be able to have it early on for the pull. So great presence of mind by band name to make sure that he was able to watch out for that. As you're seeing all those other mana orbs kind of spewing out here, it looks like they're just going to fight up against it and get burned by it, right? As you're seeing all those orbs coming out, and you ideally want to be able to actually just kite them away from these orbs, because when the orbs actually do end up hitting up against the mana devourers, they will be detonating for a substantial amount of damage here, and they keep on releasing and, and just piling on the deaths. Yeah, they just kept trying to get those mobs down, which were already sub-15, sub-10%, and that's a big Oofington bear for me, dog, <laughs> as they end up wiping <laughs> completely. And I think they killed some of the mana worms off, if I'm not mistaken. Perhaps not, but there were certainly enough of them alive that they're going to have to do another repeat for that, as you can see them running around the side now, taking it a bit slower, because, of course, they used most of their skiddies on that. It's very surprising to me as well, because one of the most simple solutions to be able to deal with this is just start kiting down the hallway and having you know, not having to worry about all of the extra orbs coming out. It is such a pain to be able to soak all of these and put more pressure on the healer to be able to heal all of them up. And while they can get that you know, damage buff coming in from it, it's so much easier just to be able to kite these around and just take Sacralash and just start gunning it down the hallway. It's not even about getting that damage buff from them because you can do that. I'm not, they didn't concentrate them down the hallway because of the time loss for travel. They thought that, hey, we can blow these up before it gets too out of hand. Two more deaths on the board as Coach Mitt goes down twice. Dart goes down as well. That's another three on the board as they struggle to finish these mana devourers off. More balls are shooting out from the mana devourers. Everybody's struggling to pick up what they can. Dark goes down again at 20. It'd be interesting to see what Shell's Angel is going to be doing here because, you know, again, they still have quite a, me a few deaths going onto the board here. As you're seeing, they do have the 10 to of Methods 20, so they still have some deaths that they have to accrue for. But if they're able to play this more cleanly, if they're going to get everything in together in one big pull, this is going to be the area that, you know, Shell's Angels could really use to get back into this. This, this is where the big turnaround can happen. If they pull this Mana Devourer pack off, they are well ahead of Method NA, as Method NA is just now cleaning the remaining half of the Mana Devourers on the side quite well this time but there is a 10 death difference between them 50 seconds a huge amount of time for these caliber of teams everything's brought together a we gripped immediately we're gonna see if they start kiting or not yeah, at this point it looks like again executing the similar strategy of just trying to make sure they're getting away but they do start to kite a little bit on the later side so there will be a little bit of damage coming out of here from the orbs that they are going to collide with sira ash and doru going down here they do still keep up Haru as he was able to just deal a lot of get out of a lot of it but again Going down once again, you are seeing just so much damage going out from a lot of these mobs, and they're not going to kill any of them. Another heartbreaking low percent wipe on these mana devourers. Shell's Angels follows suit to Methods and Method NA's wipe just earlier. Method NA finally moving past that point and up the bridge at the 87% trash count that they wanted earlier. They will be doing the, the chess event first, getting some percent there, and of course returning back afterwards to kill some of the bats before they move on while the RP is done for Visidu. Shell's Angels had the best opportunity here to catch up and now they find themselves with a three death deficit and none of those mana devourers killed. That's right, and then being able, having to just start from fresh here as Method NA is just getting back into the lead here and re-establishing it as they're engaging with a chess event. Important to be able to take down the Knights, especially as quick as possible, because they will be dealing just the AoE burst damage and, you know, a small effect around them whenever they do land onto a new zone there. It's important to be able to kill these chess pieces, then be able to start cleaving down, uh, you know, the other pieces once you start focusing the King. Any chess piece that you kill will just remove the immunity shield onto the King and allow him to start dealing damage onto this, it. This, of course, being the best viewpoint that we could see for the chess event as another wipe comes out for shells angels completely i don't even know if they pulled all of the mana worms there i think that was just a wipe on some of them but another full wipe five deaths on the board for shells angels method and a still working on this chess event and, you know i was going to say i love seeing this viewpoint for the chess event because you're killing a bunch of alliance units which just feels so good um, as they start back on the king who's now stunned one of the units going down you want to get below that 30 percent threshold on the king as we all know by now of course at home to make sure he doesn't reapply that immunity shells angels again trying to do the same pull that has been wiping them twice now at this point. They want to be able to do whatever they can to kind of get back into this, and it looks like it's just going to be able to follow Sloot in the same situation, where they need to start kiting again. They're taking a bunch of damage from all the orbs that are colliding in with it. If they're going to be able to get some really good distance as Divine is just trying to book it as fast as he can here, looks like they will be able to take this down now. Five. Absolutely correct, Jack, as they move through that hall. I mean, both of these teams just struggled so much with that pull. Method and A finally downing the chess event. You can see JB moving forward 
Lord getting ready to trigger the RP uh, in order to spawn the uh, open the door rather uh, towards Visa Doom. The rest of the team will kind of backpedal here and grab some more of these bats, making sure they kill them by the time around the RP finishes. Yeah, at this point, they're just grabbing you know, the three bats left remaining to them. Just have to watch out for the Feld rest that will be going out there. And at this point, they're not really wasting too much time having to backtrack because the RP event does take such a while for them. So you are seeing, of course, the Strata Concealment going up. It will be able to start skipping on past. You know, of course, the, the Feld Mage is going to be going out over there, and they will just be able to start moving on to the chest event. But Shell's Angels, I mean, we've seen wipes in the past on Visit Doom at the last second, and you know, the last platform having all the mobs stacking up necrotic but they're really going to be able to need something big to be able to get back into this and Haru, of course does go down they'll have to have another res for shells angels after which they're going to do the chess event and as well have to jack track just a bit as they pull some of those bats down from the sky the same three bats as before method and a moving forward the door is now open for visit doom the final boss of the dungeon they'll waste no time getting right on him at this point, you know, they want to just keep their eye on a Visidoom. He does have three that they need to be able to watch out for. Important to watch out for not only, you know, the I-beam coming out from his Disintegrate, the Burning Blast can be interrupted and provide a nice Cephus proc available to them. But then they finally will be able to have, I believe it's the, 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 the Shadow Orbs, I believe it's the Chaotic, uh, not the Chaotic Energy, but it's the Shadow Orbs coming out that will put a nasty debuff onto one target on the first uh, platform here, two onto the next, and three in the following, the final platform. Important to make sure you get the Dispel off when the target is standing still, and dodging the Orbs as hitting them will deal a substantial amount of damage to you as well as an AOE effect to anybody nearby. So 66% is what we're looking at here for Method and A to reach before Visidoom will fly off to his first platform, as uh, Jack mentioned. Now, those Swirlies, even though there's a lot of them, you usually look at these effects when there's so many, you're like, yeah, they won't hit me that hard, but they actually do a pretty large amount of damage. Want to make sure you're avoiding all of those well interrupted there. Want to make sure you don't stack too many dots on band name as they all rush upstairs in the portal. Fortunately, they have access to uh, quite a lot of mobility within this group, of course, outside of band name, so they'll be able to quickly cross this ship over to Visidoom on the other side. And this point you know they have to watch out for the disintegrate beams that are going to be coming out usually leaning towards the left or right side in turn by the time that you are actually reaching the center of his platform right you know right on top of him he will break out of the disintegrate cast so it's important to run up as quickly as you can dodging those beams while dodging any of the little electrical fields that are li that line up on the sides of his uh, runway there and being able to immediately get back onto him and start the second phase so 47 percent already they're still holding on to that bloodlust want to make sure they don't take any chances with that third uh, phase the second ship that Visidoom will go up to in 7% from now. Shell's Angels finally finishing, of course, with uh, their event as well, starting that RP and backtracking. But JB does go down. They do have access to a battle res. Coach Myth goes down as well. They have two reses available here that they can get up, waiting until that last second before the beam goes out. And they still have a few more percent to go before they go over. But that's it for battle reses for about 30 seconds. Yeah, at this point, I mean, it hasn't been too big of a disaster for them because, like you said, they did have two that they banked the entire time by playing more clean and you know early on in the instance and not wasting those battle reses early on. You know, being able to hold on to them there has just been such a nice utility for them to be able to get back into this and not actually end up having a wipe. They will have lust be able to be used once they have to deal with all these sentries and get them nuked down immediately here because they can stack up necrotic extremely rapidly. And Bandain does not have access to that perk either. Bloodlust comes down immediately, wanting to make sure you slow and kite those ads as much as possible. You can already see he goes to the extreme edges of that ship, making sure that they interrupts that stabilized rift at the last second. Now, this phase, they're already halfway through it because you just have the luxury of waiting for the boss to just sit there and cast huge amounts of damage coming out of the group as Visidoom drops to 4% health. And despite that small scare, they will be able to clutch this dungeon and take a lead 2-1 in the series. Some matches are uh, prettier than others. We talked about this going in, that the trash was going to be extremely disruptive uh, at points. It certainly has a tendency to be, especially at the beginning of the dungeon. Uh, the trash, though, at the midpoint of the dungeon, all those little mana worms were, uh, were a little too much for both teams, really. Both teams having a huge of difficulty in dealing with them. I mean, I wish I had more hands so I could give that trash four thumbs down on those pools <laughs> there. Quite dangerous for both parties, and it's not an easy pull. I mean, you have the necrotic, you have the fortified, so kudos to both teams. They both tried to do it, and were just shy of the damage they needed to finally finish off the packs. You could see both of them had a heart-wrenching wipe at about sub-10% almost on some of those worms, and it just wasn't enough. And the, at that point, you know, they're desperately trying to release, get back to it, but you just can't because there's explosions or one-shotting you. Yeah, and maybe it's the difference between the practicing on the 24 versus the 25 or the consistency that they're going to be able to have to just neutralize them as quickly as they can. And even just a little things like healer DPS, or for example, you know, or somebody not having a cooldown left available to them, just making all the difference in the world being able to execute onto that. But I'm very surprised that even after the first wipe, that they, both teams actually tried to execute it again and just failed on it.
Well, Method NA currently holding a lead, need one more map to take the Grand Finals. Will they be able to do it? Find out on the other side of this break. Yeah, just clap. A clap? <laughs> oh, man. I'm getting the right way, whatever. Oh, easy. I don't know if you want to hear about memes. Like, one, one of the biggest memes, for example, is that's why you are in the team. And another meme like that is why are you even in the team? <laughs> you know, when stuff happens, it's just. Priest is my love, but unfortunately the matter means I have to play Paladin right now. The Warlock community, <laughs> they called me the betrayer. <laughs> We wanna win. win the tournament. We wanna win. We wanna, we wanna, win. We wanna win. win. Do you guys wanna all do that at the same time? <laughs> three, 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 two, two, one. We, we wanna, wanna win. win. <laughs> win. <laughs> oh man, all right, cut it. We're done. We're done. <laughs> 
If you're keeping score now, uh, since Sloot opened up the Book of Puns, we've had a 50-plus death dungeon and a video of Rich twerking, so I'm assuming it's essentially the Ark of the Covenant, and I'm going to ask that it never, ever opens up again. My eyes are still a bit scolded from seeing uh, Rich do that, but I think I'll recover <laughs> just appropriately. Uh, well, hopefully uh, Shell's Angels will also recover appropriately after that map. Obviously, it was tough on both teams, but Method NA walking away with the win certainly makes it a little bit easier for them to swallow. Yeah, you know, both... Both teams had some uncharacteristic, uh, uncharacteristic performances in this dungeon. There were, you know, that early wipe uh, in the beginning for Shell's Angels where perhaps those mobs got a little bit too far out of that hallway and they weren't able to successfully line of sight those blasts. And then both teams just being so stubborn with that Mana Devourer pool, you know, staying in the center of the room for so long, you know, racking up that death counter. But in the very end, you know, Method was able to take the series or this game, I guess. Yeah, obviously the series is still yet to be decided. This is, of course, a best of five, so a little bit more left to this series. And Shell's Angels now uh, pushed to the brink. I don't think this is a spot they would have expected themselves to be in. Uh, they certainly were fairly confident when we spoke to them, but they're going to have to get two straight victories, which obviously over the course of the tournament we've even outlined is, is a very difficult thing given how counterpicks work. Let's go ahead and see where they are going to be taking us. Vault of the Warden's no longer available, so we're going to be heading to Court of Stars. This was another map that I did see uh, method NA practicing for. I mean, yes, uh, all teams practice this, but we saw how dominant Shell's Angels could be on this map multiple times now. So certainly one more of their uh, Bolt of the Wardens V2 Roadhouse, if you will. Um, I mean, you know, they can... They're, they're going to be big here. And I was talking to Method NA prior to this, and they were actually hoping that they'd face the other Method team. They were a bit more scared of Shell's Angels here because they felt like Shell's Angels counterpicks were perhaps not as in their wheelhouse, uh, contrary to Method Pog Champs. Certainly one thing as we look at the uh, dwindling number of available maps in the pool, uh, Mob Souls still in there, which we did see Shell's Angels have a bit of difficulty with. So if uh, Shell's Angels is able to get this win here, which we would expect them to as it is their map, obviously room for Method and to disrupt that plan. Uh, are we expecting to just go to Mob Souls? I think this is a very interesting talking point. I, I don't think so. I think we might see a lower Karazhan after this, but we'll have to see as we're about to get right into this dungeon. All right, Court of Stars. If Method NA wins, they are the Grand Finals champions. So putting it all on the line here, and like you mentioned, I really like being able to see Quarter Stars being in Shell's Angels' favor, you know, having it in their wheelhouse. We've just seen Sierra just putting out such a great performance here, and, you know, i got to have love for my other freaks, buddy. Yeah, I know. I mean, I hear you. The reason I really like coming to Quarter Stars is because they have this romantic boat ride, and I just f dream of it every night, Jack, that you and I will one day ride that gondola together again. But let's talk about the dungeon most importantly here. As uh, they do prepare, we're going to see likely that the CC come up on that very first mob. A lot of wasted time. Similar to what we've seen with the other quarter stars, a huge kind of stealth coming through and then a massive pull right in front of patrol captain. Very important to always make sure you're waiting for the road to be able to get the sap off. I believe Sierra is just going to be running with uh, you know, the displacement to make sure that he's able to get a little bit of an AOE silence, AOE, AOE interrupt there. Make sure that he's going to be able to just help out a little bit more on top of the impacts. And one of the biggest points we always want to be watching out for is those double Inquisitor packs on the teaming that we'll be dealing with here. Because while the bosses have been deadly, and for a lot of these teams, it's, they have been you know, very well handled in general the double inquisitor packs that we've had to deal with each time have just proven so lethal in in many situations here it's always something they got to watch out for lethal indeed we see the stealth starting out of method and a already as jb is moving upstairs to kind of prepare as he can himself stealth prepare for a likely very large pull coming out of them shells angels all grouping up together getting ready to move across the bridges i've seen before with that rogue stealth and then doing just a really meaty gorfiend's grass right into the middle of the area getting a lot of damage huge pull here coming out of method and with that harbor now. Yeah, very interesting to see, you know, the timing that they're going to be having on it because it will slightly delay their bloodlust uh, otherwise, yeah, well, opposed to Shell's Angels, which is moving right on to Patrol Captain Gerdo here, going to be making sure they're getting that lust off as quickly as they possibly can here. Big focus on them to be making sure they're getting that trash percent early for Meta NA. But uh, it is interesting to be able to see if, they're, if that will be the best decision because we've seen on the side of Shell's Angels where they made the same harbor pull plus one of the mini-bosses later on. Yeah, and you know, want to remind those at home where once again in that necrotic state, you can see Band Name getting a lot, or not a lot of healing rather, having a lot of difficulty getting that health pool up because of the mass amount of necrotic stacks. Nonetheless, they do manage to down uh, the rest of the trash there. Haru over on Shell's Angel's side did dip low there for a second. We saw that lay on hands uh, come out of Syrah just earlier, so they won't have that available to them for a fair few minutes now. Shell's Angel's moving into the area where patrol captain, well, kind of uh, patrols, spoiler, uh, <laughs> and, and will be shutting off some of those towers, expecting to see from them a lot of uh, pulled trash on top of this boss just a bit later on. Yeah, we've seen, you know, the 
bringing in, for example, any of the, uh, the little worm packs with the guard and stuff like that onto the sides there, making sure they're getting that extra kind of cleave damage out onto it. At this point, you so much focus onto the single target damage right before the arcane lockdown comes in. You know, Sierra doing a great job making sure to step out of melee to avoid any of the little laser beams coming out here. He freedoms, of course, the rogue, and he just probably puts the dispel out onto the monk here, allowing, of course, the druid just to shapeshift as Sierra gets out of melee and just does the regular jumps onto his own. There should be no problem for them to handle that. Uh, 17 seconds left on the Bloodlust over on Shell's Angel's Method and A. Just now cleaning up the rest of the trash as they themselves move into Patrol Captain's room. Now, Method and A being a bit slower to access the boss here for a good reason. Of course, they are 17% ahead on trash. Soon to be slightly more as they're finishing the last two of these mobs in this teaming environment. Teaming, of course, meaning there's more trash available in the dungeon. But you also need to kill more of the trash to obtain your 100%. Yeah, and they do a great job making sure they're kind of mixing in any little extra mana worm poles once Divine's able to actually drop his necrotic stacks, pull more mobs, being able to actually get a couple of stacks here and then steadily kiting away from them, doing an excellent job there. You're also seeing Zero pop in his uh, uh, Devotion Aura during the last Arcane Lockdown there, help reduce the damage not only the entire group is taking, but also help, you know, normalize the damage Divine Field is taking, so that way he's making it a little bit easier to actually, uh, you know, get all the mobs in together, even when he's just trying to drop those necrotic stacks and dropping incredibly low in the process. Yeah, but they just do this so well. We've seen them do it before. All of those worms go down. Safety for Divine Field as well. Patrol Cap for those at home will die at 25% as every team has access to the flask in the middle of the room. Of course, all other elements for uh, classes and professions have been disabled in this dungeon for integrity and RNG purposes. So Patrol Captain going down here for Shell's Angels after which we'll expect Sierra, of course, to do that run up, start the event, and the rest of the team will use the old backdoor strat. That's right, and you're seeing your uh, Zero just getting a little bit of parkour to be able to move around, of course, that construct there. You can drop the stun on him, but uh, as the... Uh, as the construct inevitably starts kind of chasing after you there, it can be a pain as it can kind of just jump on top of you at the last minute. So very important that he makes it through the, through this uh, regular door, regular path. That way he'll open up the checkpoint for the rest of the team, and the team will be able to start, of course, taking on the Quarter Stars trash onto the right side here, rather than being forced to take on you know, some of the early Inquisitor imp combinations. Uh, Sarah just barely misses that perfect jump <laughs> between the stairwell, wastes a second there. But half, oh, maybe. Half a second, but almost so perfect there. As he does uh, dive through, finally starts the event, will get himself killed on purpose so that he can spawn at near that back door where the rest of the team is waiting for him. Uh, easy checkpoint there for them. Patrol Captain at 40% for Method and A side. They still have a 6% trash advantage, but certainly are starting to fall a fair bit behind because of Shell's Angel's efficiency. Mitt does go down. They have access to the battle res, 8% left on the boss. They do end up using it. No battle res for them for about four and a half minutes now. Yeah, man, at this point with Shell's Angels, they are watching out there to the death on Zira going out again. They are going to have to wait for the release uh, at that point to be able to get everybody back in together. I think it might have just been pulling mobs just a little bit too early. We're kind of waiting for all the patrols to line up the way that they want them to. Also important to watch out for the enforcer spawns as it is on the right side as you you're seeing it here. So very big pull here. They are in the open field that they have to be dealing with this. They quickly pull the Enforcer off to the side of the room here, but even with wings up, even with CDs out, it is very important to watch out. Doru's not in a favorable position here, and he does get hit along with Haru by that very large Enforcer dot. I mean, they're just not out in the open field here. They're in the Divine field right now as he's <laughs> sitting with his back against the wall. Finally de uh, deals with his AMS, but he starts getting those necrotic stacks. Fortunately, their DPS and CDs carry them through killing most of that trash off, only now dealing with the Enforcer where they can easily Dodge and LOS line of sight around the corner, making sure that fell explosion, fell detonation, excuse me, will not do as much damage to the group. So, really well done here by them. Not too many resources used in terms of uh, battle res or deaths, of course, occurring an extra five seconds on the board. Method and A has finished off Patrol Captain, and you can already see JB stealthing through. You, yep, he's stealthing through, and of course, just being able to get all the way around that way he'll be able to go into his travel form here, quickly get around the rest of the group. Unfortunately, not able to cross across the bridge there because the constructs will be able to see through stealth. But he quickly rejoins the rest of his team, and that way they'll be able to get back into it. I'm going to cut you the first of the mini-bosses spawning on the side of Shell's Angels here, which they are pulling along with the Mistress. I don't want no tool, bro, please. <laughs> I'm going to cut you getting <laughs> moved over. Give me the book over. of puns. <laughs> Oof. Uh, getting moved over to the side there. Not too dangerous of a uh, kind of mini-boss here, but certainly just a huge health dump. You want to make it as efficient as possible by dragging extra trash to her, as we can already see the Mistress and the Hound stacked on top for effective cleave, and increase a single target through a massive health pool from the Rogue, as is very common. 
with these rogue groups. Method and A now moving their way into the court area. Still 6% ahead on Trash, but they haven't yet started on their first um, on their first mini boss, their first lieutenant, as I believe their enforcer spawn was actually on the left side, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I believe their enforcer was on the opposite side, so they always have to be able to watch out for that in terms of the, you know the favorable positions they have to do. So we will be seeing a little bit more of a you know precarious uh, pull coming out on the side of Method NA when they try to get all the Inquisitors and Imps and Enforcer in all together here. If they choose to make that route, they will have to deal with quite a nasty dot like we did already see on the side of Shell's Angels. And of course, well played there by Divine Field as he did, as he did have stacks of Necrotic on top of the Shadow Slash that further decreases your healing taken by 25%. So doing well there just to kind of backpedal and play, not wanting to have any extra danger or certainly proc that perg. Sierra does go down here again. I'm not sure if on purpose. Uh, oh no, he, he actually uh, pulled Talixay right because they are dealing with one of their lieutenants here. Unfortunately, they're not able to get Zira back up from this pull there, which is the scariest part. And it'd be interesting to decide if they just do this you know, alone without him because they do have to be dealing with the mini boss. Oh, actually, interesting. The battle res. A battle res. Okay, they did end up using the battle res onto him because I was going to say, when you have any of the mini bosses up, you're not able to actually release uh, Spirit from this. So you do have to make sure that you're getting him up to be able to deal with this pull because while the harbor pull a lot of times has been done without a healer, keep in mind we're on that 25 and teaming scenario so that you will be able to need you know not only the extra healing from it, but also maybe just a little bit of extra damage and stuns available. Right, you are, Jack. Now, the third lieutenant is available here, so they've kind of skipped over the eye boss for a moment, if I'm not mistaken. I believe they kind of did a trick where he was pulled to the side. The boss and the third lieutenant were pulled through. I don't think they've killed the eye boss, right? Unless time has just kind of stood still for me, so I'll have to keep an eye on it. But I do remember I'm Cut you having died recently, and of course they don't have access to that hunter trap. So we'll see in just a moment before I uh, talk too many obscenities. So <laughs> see exactly what they're doing there. But Method and A now working on I'm a Cut you, uh, and of course some of the trash in the area as well. Once again, she is not too threatening. You want to get as much efficient cleave on her as you can. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see if they did end up pulling it. It might have been that they grabbed an enforcer onto another side, and they had the eyeball boss being dragged over to it, and then they just grabbed you know the the main boss Talixay, and then just moved it all the way out here. It'd be interesting to see. Yeah, he certainly is alive in the distance. Okay, yeah, there, so there I, it is. So I think they kind of did a bait and switch here, where they did pull the eyeball boss to the side, which is probably why Sierra died. They pulled Talixay along with the third lieutenant through. Talixay will despawn. Lieutenant is then aggroed on the tank, but the eyeball boss of course, will reset aggro after he's killed his current target. Nowhere near the tank and the third lieutenant. Really clever work by them here as they down the third lieutenant, and they pull the last enforcer at this point that they need to kill the eyeball boss in just a moment. So that was where Sierra had his death, which required the battle rest. So great timing and actually execution there, where they already have strategies in place if they don't actually get the perfect enforcer spawns that they want to and be able to deal with here. So the last of the big trash they have to deal with here is the Inquisitor into the Enforcer here. Always important to be watching out for. Of course, the Enforcer's fell detonation here. As you are seeing Zero Bubble just to be making sure he's playing on that safer side here as Divine Field is just court kiting back here. They're doing a great job to be interrupting the ice storms here right as the cast gets off, making sure they're getting the quick grip or stun. And then, of course, just doing a great job moving around the pillars here. That grip was actually a moment late, so the ice technically did cast. Fortunately, the mob was low enough health that it got finished off, along with the Enforcer here spawning the eyeball mini boss, the last one that they need to deal with prior to having access to Talixay, the second boss of the dungeon. Bear in mind, we are in this tyrannical setting, so these two back almost back-to-back -back bosses coming up are will be a particular danger now their bloodlust is not available for another minute 45 and we did see them use it on this boss earlier because this boss's damage is technically uncapped in this tyrannical setting and will start to be largely unhealable by the end whereas we know Melandris, the last boss does cap out at a certain amount of images and therefore aoe damage on the group i'm pretty scared of seeing uh, how shells i'm pretty i'm very much looking forward to seeing how shells angels will be able to deal with this because like you said you, you do have to actually pace yourself quite a bit more throughout the encounter here be interesting to see if they end up trying to bloodlust halfway through the fight, which will be make things considerably easier, which will also mean that you'll probably be seeing, you know, Tears Deliverance or Holy Avenger coming out much earlier out of the side of Zero to be able to keep up with, uh, you know, all the damage that's going to be happening while they don't have bloodlust left available to them. So it might be something where, you know, maybe wings will be used very early on in the fight, you transition into Tears Deliverance into Holy Avenger, have bloodlust available after that, and then finish the fight again with wings. So we'll just have to see exactly what they do. Both teams working on the same lieutenant, but we, of course, know Shell's Angels kind of had a uh, awkward order, if you will, something that we're not used to seeing on live or on most of the runs in this maps, even throughout this MDI tournament. Very clever play from them. Getting ready now to pull Talixay in just a moment, making sure that the patrol is nowhere nearby so that they don't accidentally proxy any of those mobs. Method and A finishing their second lieutenant, and of course the remaining 4% that they need will be their final enforcer, unless they do the uh, the trick, but they've already cleared the harbor, uh, so I'm not sure exactly how they're going to want to finish their last 4%. That's the interesting thing, is if they do end up do taking the same you know trick that 
Shells Angels has done, which it looks like they are yeah, going to yeah. be doing and executing. They have some trash percent that they can actually end up going after here, but it's nowhere near as efficient as we've seen out of Shells Angels. So in many ways, you are just having a little bit of a disadvantage going into this where you are not pulling any extra trash in along with the mini boss here, and you just have to be able to deal with it there and just deal with the mini boss by itself. You're absolutely correct in a nutshell as they start working on Shell's Angels. Uh, and it seems like the both of them uh, actually despawned there, That's if right. I'm not mistaken. Uh, so that uh, trick didn't work out so well for Method NA here. They're going to have to either try it again or look where that next enforcer is here, buying them, uh, I'm not buying them, or rather, costing them, costing them a bit of an extra time as a result. Shell's Angels still working on Talixay. Now, Shell's Angels was still a fair bit ahead uh, at this point. Um, they've already started working on Talixay well before Method and A would have even started on that lieutenant. We finally, Jack, do see the Bloodlust come up for Shell's Angels here. Yeah, interesting to see the wings going off at the same time as Bloodlust. A lot of times, it would be interesting to see, you know, how much focus he wants to be able to have on using his resources there. And a lot of times, the Holy Power and again, like we said in the last time, it, it is on just propping everybody back up with your beacon of virtue and, and rapidly topping off the entirety of the group. So you're seeing him quickly transition from wings into devotion aura into getting his tears, or sorry, getting in his beacon of virtue back up onto the group here. So in this in this way, he actually is playing extremely aggressive with his cooldowns here, and with. He, with him actually having such high haste be able to cast the Holy Lights, it looks like he might end up be running Sefus, or in fact just be able to have the Intervet from the Druid left available to him. But you're seeing the Divine Shield going out as he drops the Sacrifice onto one of the DPSers here, likely the Druid to make sure he's kind of reducing the damage going out onto him, because as you're seeing right now, once the Sacrifice fell off, he can be chunked quite heavily. Yeah, so that was pretty close from them. Doing well to bait, of course, that Infernal Eruption where the Imp spawn one Imp uh, per player. Wanting to make sure you bait all of those together makes it very easy, especially for the Solar Beam to go down and silence all of the uh, surrounding imps method and a working on some of that remaining trash right now and getting ready to pull their third lieutenant talixate will be falling here in just a moment for shell's angels yeah and they're doing an excellent job here making sure they're taking care of those ads as well as possible there and they make almost an entirely full rotation around of course the flower garden to make sure they're getting rid of it uh getting rid of the imps as rapidly as possible phenomenal damage on the side of shell's angels to make sure that they're uh focusing the imps down not actually causing any extra problems for it because while that fight can be quite dangerous of course for the healers any extra imps that it kid casts off will just misspell disaster for the team method and a waiting for the lieutenant uh, whose trick didn't work earlier now they will be dpsing him down shells angels looking for the uh, evil guest they seem to have marked a skull they're getting ready to hopefully find the correct person as they did uh one of the fortunate spawns as well closer closest actually as possible to the balcony so not as much downtime in terms of him walking over to the balcony revealing himself as one of those evil dreadlords which they will dps down in a moment and then of course move on to melandris yep, and at this point you know divine field is getting into position waiting for jaina i mean the dreadlord to uh, spawn up next Oof. to them be able to actually get the key from them which will again like you said unlock melandris's room important things to watch out for is just gonna be the carry and swarm frontal that they'll be able to quickly dodge and then of course the cripple which will also offer zero just a nice way to be able to get a nice easy sefus proc and we can see here jack the vile has spawned making sure that they kind of stack together for a bit of that extra healing because of the mastery of how Holy Paladins work, especially after that huge hit from the Shadow Bolt volley. Method just downing the third lieutenant now as they start to hurry over towards Talix, say, but Shell's Angels uh, a fair bit ahead, and they were, have been a fair bit ahead ever since a lot of the efficient pulls combining trash and enforcers and boss earlier that we've seen. We've seen them do this map many times successfully, and it seems to follow suit here as well. Downing in just a moment, Gareth, and then they will go over and open the door to Melandris. Yeah, man, you're seeing Zero running again early ahead to help out with the mechanics, make sure that once Divine Field is able to pick up the key, Zero will be there to actually open up the gates of the door and be able to start the boss fight as quickly as possible here. So the emphasis really gets on a method NA as they're pulling into Talix, say, again, having to focus down these imps as rapidly as possible moving through those different CDs to make sure everyone's staying, staying topped off here. You were seeing the last of the Shadow Bolt Volley going off here, but it wasn't too big on the side of Shell's Angels because at that point, the, the mob was dead. And Sierra's already gone, waiting at the door for the moment that the key was picked up by Divine Field to open this door and start the remainder of the RP for the encounter as quickly as possible. Melandris, of course, one of the more dangerous bosses that we always think about when thinking uh, with Tyrannical, but he does cap off damage, part of the reason why that Bloodlust was used earlier. As soon as you get six or seven images, something like that, you will reach cap damage, so as long as the team can handle that, which they've shown they can already, it should be no problem. Yeah, but at this point, you, again, like we see in the past, just watching the positioning there, make sure they're baiting out any of the images off to the side of the room there when he will have that Blade Surge going out onto one of the ranged targets, making sure the door is the only one out, so that he, it'll always go out to the exact same position every time. 
Method NA has been doing a great job controlling the ads on the side of Flame Wreath here, making sure everyone's staying inside Effervescence, keeping all the hots going up into it, and really showing how powerful cultivation can be as getting you know, full germination, cultivation hots up, hitting it with a big flourish has just made his healing just so powerful, and only having him actually focus on some of the more triage healing with a couple re regrowths here and there. And they're opting to actually hold on to their Bloodlust for Italics, a confident that they have the DPS to down it before things get too out of hand. Belandris at 75%, four shells, Angers doing an excellent job uh, Doro over there on the side to make sure he baits all of those images out so that these piercing gales are all facing the same direction. Very easy for the group to dodge and making sure you don't get nicked by any uh, slicing maelstrom by accident. Yep, and you're seeing there uh, uh, Zero just getting a quick dispel out onto Divine Field before the uh, slicing maelstrom went out. Allows him to get his Cephus proc, increasing his haste substantially to be able to just top everybody off when he's speaking of Virtue Window there. Very important to make sure you're able to do. The next uh, slicing maelstrom coming up will be the consumption com buff coming up for the team, giving them a huge amount of leech, and you always be able to have one of those two tools uh, for the extra support. Now that we've gotten to the point where we're going to be able to have uh, you know, the damage capped out from the Slicing Maelstrom, you're always going to be looking for some kind of cooldown or some kind of defensive, either by the rest of the group or by the healer to make sure everyone's going to stay alive through this. So you might be seeing a Tears Deliverance Holy Avenger combination coming up soon, or you'll be seeing, you know, maybe more mass defenses. As you're seeing, actually, wings being popped here. Make sure that he'll be able to start topping off the group quickly with the Slicing Maelstrom. So we did see a nice uh, kind of cleanup there of those gales, those win uh, whirlwinds going on on the side by Ashine as he ran over pre-cloak, make sure to eat them up. Anybody who comes in contact with those does get stunned for about four seconds. Uh, oftentimes, as you mentioned, the healers do use it to their advantage so that they can proc that Cephas with the Dispel, so they can kind of ping-pong that consumption Cephas. Pretty difficult to see from these healers. Another slicing Maelstrom coming in there while Method NA is looking for the evil guest. Yeah, at this point, you know, they do have to make sure they're going through the rest of that as, of course, they're walking their way up, having to deal with Gareth the Vile. Still substantially ahead, like we were talking about, where they had some good execution onto this, but I don't think their pulls were necessarily as clean or as well-tuned as Shell's Angels there. Having to take, for example, Jazz, the last of the mini-bosses alone, instead of pulling it all the way with the harbor there, it does put some extra pressure onto the team and make for a very risky pull, but Shell's Angels has been no stranger to those risky pulls and having them work being so successful to the team and actually just getting to the grand finals here. Uh, it's been pretty excellent for them. Uh, a bit of a misstep there with Melander says they kind of kept him right in the middle of that piercing gale area, so the melee did have to lose a couple seconds DPS moving away. Uh, well timed there, though, by Ashine with that death from above, making sure he's in there right as those piercing gales hit just before he would have been hit himself. No problem dealing with the slicing maelstrom. As we said, they've already, of course, capped that damage out. They know they can handle it, and they know what their DP or their healing rather CDs and survivability CD rotations are going to be at this point. Yeah, but they do a great job. I mean, actually, we're seeing Doru dropping into bear form there, putting the extra quick uh, Frenzy regen hots onto himself. That way he'd be able to get himself, you know, secured as we're dealing with that slicing maelstrom. You might be able to see it at the very end here, just to be playing out absolutely safe. You are seeing Hero going down. They have the battle res left available to them. 2% left on Melandres for Shell's Angels as they had a dominant performance in this Court of Stars here taking it two to two. Yeah, and I mean, it, it's no surprise. We saw the, how well they do this dungeon, not just earlier, but earlier in the tournament as well. So really well performed there by them. And I, I like this, you know, Rob, we talked about this as well, just how consistent they have started looking. You know, you kind of had your doubts earlier in the tournament. They certainly were a bit Dr. Jekyll, uh, Mr. Hyde going on there, but here they really are coming dominant. I mean, don't shortchange them. There's still one map here, Slew. Don't be that guy who says, I'm calling my shot, and then the shot just uh, whiffs there. I, but I will say, especially on their <laughs> maps, they have looked very polished. With, with the exception of that one ill-fated Vault of the Wardens, this is a team that is really coming together, and uh, all credit to them. This has obviously been a long day for them. They had to play the prior series. But will they be able to close it out? That's the big question. Will they be able to beat Method NA? We will find out on the other side of this break. Regardless of what happens, a champion will be crowned. Don't go anywhere.
have forgotten what makes us strong. It's come to this one final map to decide a tournament months in the making. EU, NA, two teams looking their very best in this tournament. Uh, gentlemen, it really doesn't get any better than this. Yeah, both teams have been playing dungeons we've seen them do throughout the course of this tournament, each time improving their time in all these dungeons. One dungeon remains that is in this map pool that we've seen both of these teams run, the Neltharian's Lair. Uh, Marv was telling me that he believes that Method can drop their time another two to three minutes in here, perhaps, um, and, but... Shell's Angels, of course, have been improving their time across all of these dungeons so far. So which team will be able to ink out in here? We've seen these small wipes here and there cost minutes in every single dungeon up to the series. Whichever dungeon they choose to go to, whatever happens, like whoever makes the least mistakes, whoever can play the cleanest, they're going to claim it out and they will be undoubtedly the winner and they will be the Mythic Dungeon Invitational champions. In a best of five, only three map pools left for that final pick. Nels would be so fitting considering the volume with which we saw it in 2017, Jack. It would be, and also interesting kind of cap it off of, you know, how much that they really, oh, it is Nels Lair, there it is. Oh, good. Especially yes, with how much the teams really hate bolstering and how much they push themselves really to kind of go into those bolstering dungeons to be able to go up and match up well against their opponents. What are we looking at in terms of affixes for this map? Having to deal with, of course, the tyrannical, grievous, and bolstering is gonna make for some extremely long boss fights on a 25 here. All right, well, Shell's Angels is going to have to win on the counter pick. It's, it's fitting. They're not going to get to do it on a map of their choosing. They're not going to get to do it on one of their all-star dungeons. They're going to have to do it on something Method NA has uh, selected for them. Yeah. But the thing is, we've as well seen Shell's Angels run this dungeon with a phenomenal strat at the end with that cheeky skip with the Scorpions doing the boss along the side of the room. So I, it's, this is anyone's game right here. This is anything but a counter pick, I would say. When teams are already having to play this on a 25 for the semifinals here, and this is a team I believe that they both actually ended up matching up against on a 25 level to it. So this is really going to be, you know, the redemption time for Shell's Angels. Yeah, so many things can go wrong in this dungeon, but so many things can go right. This was perhaps the most hype game that happened in the tournament when they did this before in the uh, upper bracket semifinals. And here they are again doing it for the very grand finals. This is going to be an absolutely incredible dungeon, regardless of who comes out on top. This It was so close last time. This whole series has been incredibly close with just a few pools here and there. Uh, being the difference between the winners, but as we see, the dungeon is ready to go. This is it. This is for all the marbles. Whoever wins this will be our second ever Mythic Dungeon Invitational Champion. Gentlemen, Nels Slayer, take it away. Take the marbles. <laughs> As Sowers ended up mentioning, uh, both teams actually playing up against it and having a close series. I believe it was an 11 second difference yeah. the last time these teams played on Neltharian's Lair on a 25 year. Fitting that we return right back to this dungeon where we had such a close match before bolstering Grievous Tyrannical in this 25 Neltharian's Lair to take home the final prize of that first place. Big pull coming in here from both teams, no doubt about that, but they have to be a bit careful, of course, with this bolstering environment, reminding those at home that every trash mob that dies will buff everything around it for 20% current health and damage. Yeah, I like being able to see, you know, the quick blind going out onto the larger Hulk there. They do have to be dealing with, of course, that large Scorpion mob there, as you are just starting to see, you know, tons of cleave damage going onto it. All the focus has got to be onto that Scorpion to quickly neutralize it as best as they can, because this, all the little Skitterer mobs have so little HP here. It's very important to make sure that, you know, worst case scenario, you bolster a ton of tiny mobs rather than just bolstering, you know, the one Scorpion 20-something times. Yeah, certainly, and look at all that damage coming out. You saw a moment ago some of that uh, spike single target damage from Ash. Of course, he is overcome eventually by the other two with just their mass amount of AOE, but he's the one who is the key to balancing the damage on that Scorpion and keeping that bull string in check. Method and eight, 9% on the board as they pull some more of these small crawlers, the skitterers on the side, DPSing all of them together as we did see one of them get CC'd earlier so they can deal with the kind of medium mobs first and then combine all these smallies together, keeping an eye on their HP. And they're doing an excellent job as they're grabbing, of course, the Crocs and, of course, the Hulk that they have to be dealing with here. Very, very strong single target focus. Again, is going to be that prior Priority, where they'll be able to actually get the extra focus onto them, but there's tons of damage here at going out as we have some of the more lethal mobs here we have to worry about. Yeah, that Hulk does a ton of damage. We saw Divine Field proc his perk there. LOH did come out, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, actually, no, it didn't. It was just a huge heal that came out to heal him, but it was just too little too late. Unfortunately, that perk won't be available for a while. Uh, band name, of course, with Method NA dealing on the side there. Not as big of a pull, not as dangerous, but that Hulk does a ton of damage to the tank, and once that Fracture Punt goes 
comes out, you want to make sure that you're displacing or stunning him. Otherwise, there will be a huge magic frontal. Yeah, they're having to watch out for that front. So thankfully, DKs can do an excellent job of being able to deal with it. They do a great job, again, getting all the mobs down pretty equally, finishing off that Hulk first and being able to move on here as Zira has already started the RP event, similar to how JB has done as both teams are clearing up the rest of the trash. Yeah, so a bit of trash advantage for Shell's Angels method, and they opted not to deal with that Hulk mob as it is so dangerous. Even though Blood DKs have access to a grip every single fracture, they said, hey, look, let's just get to the boss a bit faster, but not too much faster. I mean, Method and A is pulling just slightly before Shell. Actually, Shell's Angels is the one who pulled first. They started their RP first just by a couple seconds. Both teams popping their Bloodlust, and we're starting our first tyrannical boss in this Neltharian's lair. Rockmora, no stranger to destroying teams in the past here. Very large focus is going to be on the small skitters that Rockmora eventually does spawn, that they will increase the damage of his smash here. Very important to make sure that they die as rapidly as possible, and if possible, to make sure that they die in, in any kind of clumps as they will drop any of those little green void zones beneath them. The smash deals, like I said, increasing damage the more uh, the skitters that you have alive onto it. So and here, as we get into the end of this, at, in the 25 Tyrannical, making sure people are running defensive legendaries and rotating through defensive cooldowns as we get later into this with more skitters alive. Yeah, those stomps are going to do a ton of damage as the boss is kind of being kited around here in a small circle along the beach head first, wanting to make sure that the melee have room to DPS the boss without risking being in that frontal or getting punted into any of those clouds on the side. So they're going to fill up most of the room by the time they're done this boss. Neck and neck, these two teams, just 3%, 2% separating them. Yeah, very important as they're just getting themselves moved closer to the wall here, making sure that frontal is going to be taking up as little room as possible. And, of course, just dragging a line of the skitter void zones along the edge of the room whenever they can here. Great hodge just to be able to get the mob against the wall as they're going to be killing it as quickly as possible here. Next smash going out, quite a bit of damage because they did still have another skitter up. At this point, you're going to start looking at, you know, extra external cooldowns being used, maybe taking advantage of, you know, Divine Shield if he's able to, because at the same time, depending on how large of a pulls they want to go into the future, they might really have to hold on to Divine Shield or Blessed Protection. Band name, of course, finding himself between a rock and a hard place there on the side. It starts to curl and U-turn out of it as they slowly start to kite the boss in the direction of the exit for the area. Getting solo there, Shell's Angels, with that recent stomp. No deaths on the board. We do have the Grievous, though, making it particularly daunting for healers to catch up on healing after that spike damage, adding those increasing stacking stacks up to five once you dip below that 90% threshold. Always important to make sure that Virtue is prepared on the side of Zira, and then just that JB is going to be able to have at least a line of hots out onto the group to be able to quickly prop the cultivation and then get a nice wild growth follow-up to get the group back topped off here. But it, it is going to be that extra pressure again on the healers and maybe consume a little bit extra of their DPS time that they otherwise would just spend, spend just dumping into the boss here to get everybody topped off and clear out the last of those green stacks. The two teams just trading the lead back and forth, starting to pull ahead Method and A here by about 4 or 5% as they were behind 2 or 3% before, showing a bit of superiority with their single target damage, not far behind those shells angels will keep up with them likely a bit of execute uh, i would assume from marv as he does shoot up a bit of damage there at the end they'll be looking to kind of start heading out of this area in just a moment and not only that but also jb having a bit of an advantage over zira in just terms of the damage that they're able to pump out consistently there we're seeing you know uh, jb popping of course into the platform and be able to pump out a little bit extra dps here it's an aggressive move going into feral affinity on 25 tyrannical but at this point he's done such an excellent job of being able to know when he's able to play aggressively enough to just really start getting some big damage out. And Method chooses Paper and downs Rockmora as they head over to the barrel ride down the river. Uh, quite lazy, if I may add. But they do <laughs> head down. Now, typically we see Method and A, most of the teams do a quite substantial pull here with the Pelters, but they will need to have a lot of care paid attention to for that bolstering. Rockmora now going down for Shell's Angels, not far behind. Yeah, at this point, you know, there is that still 9% uh, trash advantage they have going into them. Always very important to watch as they're going to be able to make these larger pulls going up towards uh, their second boss here making sure they're going to be able to get everything in together. And they've done such fantastic control on both sides of getting the bolsters stacks under control here. Very excited to see how far they're going to be able to take with this. Because again, if you want to be able to pull the Hulk in with the rest of the group, you have to watch out for the Shaper, leaving, making sure it's getting constantly interrupted, but also having to deal with the Hulk so that way it will not be too heavily bolstered. Huge pull coming out here of Method NA. Great pull by band name, grabbing everything together, getting the damage that he needs to get to hold threat, and immediately taking that Warlock portal out of range to make sure that those pelters and of course the berserkers are unable to uh, throw discs and of course do that avalanche on the rest of the team keeping everyone healthy and safe especially those unfortunate poor squishy windwalkers that tend to lend themselves to a lot of that cleave damage a bit of bolster going on there wanting to make sure that he drags the hulk just out of range enough so that none of those bolster stacks hit the hulk yeah they did a fantastic job i was really worried about how close by they would be to the hulk to be able to get the positioning there but they're doing an excellent job thus far 
You've got to make sure they're able to kind of stay on top of the Hulk on the side of Shell's Angels because he is quite close as all of those other mobs are dropping incredibly low. They might actually have to stop damage to be able to get the Hulk out in time Ooh. because lots of bolsters are going out onto the Hulk on the side of Shell's Angels there, which is just going to take an immense amount of time to be able to get down. I was really worried about the proximity there. Yeah, so that was just a bit too close for comfort right there. Unfortunately, he does get a couple or two or three of those bolster stacks on the Hulk who already has such a dominant amount of HP compared to the other mobs and was already quite large in size. It's now filling up most of the camera. Band name does go down there. Uh, I believe it was to reset Perg. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what happened. I was paying attention to Shell's Angels with that Hulk, which they managed to down quite easily, cleaning up the rest of the drummers here, and they will head back up to the second boss's room. And yeah, they did an excellent job making sure they had that single target focus from the beginning. I was worried if they were just AoEing you know, uh, needlessly, they could have actually just bolstered it way worse. So they had a great job making sure they had, had that preparation. They were able to kind of recover from having just a couple bolster stacks. Beth and NA here moving a little bit closer into uh, pulling Ulrog than their opponents here, grabbing again this, the entire room here, grabbing the Hulk and making sure they're able to start uh, focusing him down as rapidly as they can before they're able to start displacing the rest of the mobs and making sure they're getting out of bolstering range. Ulrog uh, uh, ominously sitting up on that perch, watching the teams as they finish off the rest of the trash in the room. Following suit, Shell's Angels will do their AOE pull in the middle of the room, getting that leg sweep and beam down right away, wanting to make sure none of those Shaper's bolts, the stone bolts, are hitting any of the players. will do a pretty devastating amount of damage, even in this tyrannical setting. Does as much damage as possible, and Divine Field will start kiting back, as we saw Method NA do, as they finish up just the remaining Hulk, which was pulled out of range for the same reasons we saw in the previous pack, wanting to make sure not too many bolster stacks hit it. You do an excellent job here making sure that they're able to get you know the Hulk down extremely quickly here. They probably just completely switched to the rest of the mobs here as you are seeing them do. And doing a great job not only getting the Hulk away from the rest of them and just starting to focus it more, we're actually seeing the last minute grip by Divine Field getting it completely out of range of the other bolsters and just absolutely just annihilating them. Absolutely mob. fantastic pull from them there keeping everything in balance, just that last second grip, making sure no bolsters had caught up a bit of time uh, versus Method and A, which was pulling just a bit ahead, and they have that 17% trash advantage, which we know they use later to their benefit in order to deal with none of the trash uh, at the last boss. So Ulrog Craig Shaper pulled about the same time by both teams as he tries to uh, lend a hand there for the players, making sure to move out of the way, and will be soon transitioning into our first phase two. Yeah, but also important to note with Marvin and, of course, with Doru there, that they will be able to get some extremely nice Cephus procs on the right side you're seeing of shells angels you'll be able to see just rooting of course that shaper mob consistently whereas on the side of marvin he's able to get that quick banish out onto the uh, the elemental geode or right next to him provide a nice damage increase for both of them to be able to start moving on and just continue just laying out some huge damage here for everybody's sake i hope they were paying attention to which of these idols was the <laughs> correct one because i certainly wasn't uh, but it seems like both teams have uh, sniffed out the correct idol and will be revealing ularag in just a moment uh, almost within seconds of each other i mean this boss was pulled within a second of each other i'm pretty sure and and both teams are just following suit 80 and 81 percent uh, right to left on the screen right now and i mean it's just so close between these two teams it's really going to come down to a lot of the trash pulls coming up and that sneaky pull from shell's angels at the last boss ularog will certainly uh, have at least one more uh, down phase for both teams yeah but the tyrannical you do have to be dealing with just such a long period of time where you have all of the uh, the different totem phases to be able to guess it correctly and he just has such a large reservoir of hp left available to him so very important that they're going to be able to just keep on DPSing through this. There's not too many lethal mechanics they have to watch out for. Probably the biggest scare that they have to look out for is going to be just the transition phase when the rocks are going to be falling onto them. Having to deal with the avalanche when you're having uh, double melee compositions for both teams can be a little bit scary if any double hits are, are going out, but at this point it's going to be making sure you're watching the positioning on both sides so that they're not going to be overlapping each other. Method and A entering their second transition phase and starting to pull ahead of uh, Shell's Angels just a bit with that single target damage. Look at the monk damage on the board right now versus the other three on Shell's Angels, so they're starting to make up a bit of percent ahead of Shell's Angels, which they'll likely need later on because they do have to make up for some more uh, of the trash, both of them entering their second phase. It wouldn't shock to be uh, certainly a third phase two here later in the fight, finding the right idol and getting ready to break out of this phase before the healers are stressed too much. Yeah, at this point, you know, their lust timers are exactly the same. They're exactly the same in terms of battle reses. There's just a five-second difference for one death on the side of Method NA, which a uh, band name, of course, just resetting his purgatory there at the very end. So at this point, they're just neck and neck, but at this point, you have to watch out for 
for uh, the execute that's going to come out of Marvin a little bit later because that was also what had them uh, pulling a little bit ahead as they were dealing with uh, the first boss. Yeah, certainly both tanks doing very well to rotate the boss by 90 degrees as soon as those idols spawn, the bellowing idols, making sure that they stack on top of each other, making it easily cleavable uh, for, of course, the Windwalkers and anybody else who can lend a hand there. Uh, Ulog at se uh, Ula Rug, excuse me, at 35%. Four Shadows Angels actually starting to close that gap a bit. We did see about a 6-7% split between the two teams, now closing that down to around 2%, but we are getting in that execute phase benefit of Method, uh, which in a moment we'll see another phase two. Yeah, at this point, uh, I agree, like you said, having getting the DOS up, getting them refreshed, you're slowly getting a little bit closer into that execute phase. You're going to have Ulrog going down on the side of Shell's Angels. About exact same percentage almost uh, that they have to be dealing with there. They're just cleaning up the rest of those Avalanche totems as they do have to be following, of course, the final ones here. Are you even paying attention to this one, Sloot? Absolutely not. <laughs> just like on Live Jack, I usually make you do that job. That's but right. it seems that these teams will be on the ball. Nice stack for Method, and they're going to get a bit of cleave damage uh, to bolster those numbers. Ulrog does pop back up for Method, and they'll be looking to close this one out before he progresses to another second phase. Idol going down on Shell's Angel side on the left side, re-revealing Ulrog in just a moment as well. Looks like Methrenae will definitely be closing this fight out prior, but we still have that 17% trash. It'll be interesting to see as well because Shell's Angels has taken such a quick path with trash, and even by pulling, you know, another what 17% in terms of trash percentage, they weren't even that far behind. I'm interested in seeing the bloodlust going out onto the side of Shell's Angels here to be burning the last 15-16% of Ulrog here. If they're actually going to be getting full duration or maybe they're going to be anticipating getting it at the very end of the instance here. Yeah, I think they'll be using it definitely on the last boss, if I remember correctly, from what we saw in their previous run at this. And I mean, they had this map down to a T last time, so certainly they know the timing or what timing to expect, rather, especially with how flawless and clean their run has, be, uh, has been. Ularog does go down, so they do waste about 10 seconds of that bloodlust, about 25% of it wasted, but perhaps it's for excuse me, the greater good, uh, making sure that they have it available when they need it for the final boss. We already see Band Name here pulling some of those Ritualists on the side and getting ready to move into the room for Narrowlax, the, uh, the third boss of the dungeon. Uh, I guess it might as well be used there because it will take such a long time to be able to kill the final boss here. And while they have cleared so much trash that's available to them, getting all the CCs ready, getting it all prepared to be able to deal with the final boss will take quite a bit of time. So if they're able to get even a couple seconds left, you know, even if they're getting maybe half a duration of Bloodlust at the very end of the instance. It, it looks like it might be worth to them. It looks like they will just be able to play as aggressively as possible and try to keep up with uh, Method NA in terms of just the bosses and keep getting the bosses down as quickly as they can. Doing well to interrupt the Shaper here that does a lethal amount of damage to the players, even in this uh, tyrannical setting. Uh, making sure to grip everything together. Now, one of the Worms does pour it off and unfortunately gets a bit of bolster there, a double bolster, as they kind of desperately grip it back in, trying to balance everything out as well as possible. Not too much danger, but they did certainly waste a few seconds with the amount of health that uh, just came up off of it. Method and A dealing with their first pack in this room, making sure to CC the two larger mobs and pulling all of these smaller worms well out of bolster range for the remaining two, cleaving them down as quickly as possible, and then dealing with the remaining two mobs. Uh, something that we'll likely similarly see from uh, the Shells Angels team, unless they actually just single target focus, which it seems like they will with that rogue. Yeah, it looks like they're just going to make sure they're letting the rogue just do what he does best and just take care of all the single target damage as they can. It looks like they might be having a little bit of an advantage here. It doesn't seem like it's going to be too substantial, but it definitely does just kind of expand upon the threat that it can have having these mobs where it looks like a lot of the actual smaller uh, worms are actually taking a lot more damage here, so they really have to make sure they retarget here, get back on top of the Grubmaster here to focus it down as best as they can as the bolsters are going to start coming in in just a moment here. I mean, just excellent discipline from them, not the Priest Jack. On <laughs> excellent discipline from the team, making sure to kill the high-priority targets, stopping that cleave that's ever so juicy and tempting for a lot of the TPS in there, and appropriately downing all of the trash. Excellent play here from Shell's Angels. They finish off the trash as Naraxxus is now pulled by Method already. Yeah, you're slobbering over here. Watch it, all right? Narax is very important to watch out for the two Devouts coming out from the ledge above. If Naraxxus does end up being able to consume them, she will then receive just a very hefty damage increase. I believe it's 50% per stack going out. Uh, periodically, she will also spawn just poison debuffs onto the entire group. More often than not, it's not that worth to be able to dispel them unless you're going for, say, like a Sefu's proc uh, that you'd like to be going after. Uh, but most of the time, just to be able to dispel them, it won't be for the healing effect. It won't be too worthwhile there. So at this point, you're just going to be healing through those and focusing any of the targets as, of course, Narax is 
will spawn a couple spooge pools that will then slow the tank as he's getting dragged back in. Ah, the old spooge pools, of course. And now we do see the ever so dangerous Richa Dials popping up on the left side of the screen for <laughs> Shell's Angels. We did see them do this before. It's to benefit the extra single target damage that they can pump out by having extra mobs in melee range. Now, these aren't too dangerous for really anybody else in the group except for the tank's extra damage on top of the already hard-hitting tyrannical boss. But if they can pull it off, the amount of single target damage they gain should well be worth it, as we can see the rogue starting to skyrocket above the rest. Yeah, very important to always watch out for, like, again, Doru's passive cleave with Starfall, making sure you try to keep it out of the way of the boss there. That way he won't be too, uh, you know, too harmed in terms of a single target rotation there. We're going to see a little bit of that cleave damage going on to it, so there still will be a, just a huge focus to make sure that any of those mobs are just going to be able to just uh, live as long as possible because the bolster threat is incredibly high there, and uh, if they do actually add any extra damage to your any extra HP to the boss not only is the extra damage threat that zero will have to heal through but so much HP in the tyrannical setting they'll just prolong the boss fight unnecessarily I mean the rogue just keeps pulling further and further ahead and it is slightly starting to close that gap between them and method and a on the boss health percent devouts are worked on and just absolutely destroyed by shells angels as with method and a on the right side of the screen both teams doing an excellent job keeping everything in check making sure they bait a lot of these pools to the side and making sure of course on the side of Shell's Angels not to kill those uh, Nashers before the boss dies. That would be absolutely devastating with the bolstering. Yeah, that 47% here to Methods 35 as they're going out through this. Yeah, very important to note that, you know, that Method is not going to be able to have any extra little cleave damage going on to it. And this has kind of shut down some teams in the past or made them change their strategies as we've had some dungeons changing going into the land tournament here where some previously, you know, everybody was more than happy to be pulling, you know, extra mobs into the boss here. But when you're having that extra focus, for example, where they have to make sure that they're going to be able to deal with bolstering as best as they can, even in a situation like this where it can potentially be, you know, changing how divine and maybe how Doru are playing in terms of the, you know the uh, you know, using less heart strikes or watching out for when they are actually able to use those heart strikes. It's so cool to be able to see those changes in strategy. And Method is certainly holding their own as they reach that kind of execute phase for the Warlock to be uh, taking advantage of it. And, you know, they're keeping that 9 to 11% distance ahead of Shell's Angels, regardless of that rogue getting so much extra single target damage from those mobs on top of it. Method doing an outstanding job and an outstanding amount of DPS on Araxis as they start to actually widen the gap even more, getting ready to down the third boss and desperately move into the fourth room because they still have that 10%. Actually, what will be 16% uh, amount of trash to make up because Shell's Angels will end up at that 100% once Naraxxus dies. It'll be interesting to see how much time that they're going to get on the side of Shell's Angels or Bloodlust as well because, again, Method NA is holding on to it for the last boss. They know they're going to be able to have it at the ready when they need to. They still have a lot of trash they have to clear out there, but I don't know if uh, Shell's Angels is going to get a great uptime with three and a half minutes remaining before uh, you know they're able to get Bloodlust back. Method NA, of course, jumping down the wormhole, not to a different galaxy, <laughs> rather just to the lower area of Neltharian's lair where they will make up the remaining 16% of the trash that's required. They can't pull, I mean, they can. It would be quite dangerous to pull any of the scorpions along with the boss. We're seeing a, a double pack pull here for Method and they gripping the five mobs together to get most of the percentage that they still require. Shell's Angels has also now down Naraxxus, finishing up the last of their trash. And we've seen the trick and the kind of pull that they do here on the final boss of the dungeon. They'll move up, CC everything, pull it to the side. The rogue will vanish and they're going to work solely on the boss without killing any extra trash. Yeah, I like being able to see the kite coming out on the side of Band Name Mayor, making sure that, you know, none of the Pelters, for example, are going to be uh, getting out any kind of damage, but also any of the champions there are not going to be causing any avalanches that any of the melee have to worry about. But being able to just kite away in many cases just shut down any kind of boss ability or any mob abilities there. It's such a convenience point for them. Shell's Angels here are going to have to make sure they pull the CC off perfectly, getting the blind, getting the par paralysis off, and they're going to be able to just start pulling away those two trappers there as you're seeing the Blessing Protection going out, pulling the two trappers away, and then quickly getting that invisible, or the, sorry, quickly getting the vanish off once, of course, the boss has been pulled. Spectacular done by them. Again, as that bop goes off, fades. The rogue does vanish. Everything resets, and here we go. Dark Gruel, final boss of the dungeon pulled for Shell's Angels. Method and a dealing with the last of the trash that they need to. They do have that bloodlust available. Shells Angels does not for another two minutes and 20 seconds, and it's going to be a close one again here, Jack. Yeah, 10 second difference between the last time that they faced off on the exact same level, exact same instance here. Only one death in the side of her method NA here as Shells Angels 86% onto the boss as they first get their they get their first crystal spike out onto, of course, the, the uh, berserker, or sorry, onto the larger mob here, getting the extra damage uh, buff onto him and be able to take him down so quickly here. The yeah, 
Charskin, I'm yeah, no, I'll, I'll accept your apology. <laughs> Charskin absolutely melts. Any slip up here from Shell's Angels, and they will easily get punted into some of those Scorpion trash that they left up. They have to play 100% accurate here. No room for error. Landslide needs to be pointed away by the tank at all times. You want to make sure you don't get punted by the Swirly from the Crystal Wall spawning. You may want to make sure that you don't proxy the pack by accident as you hide for the uh, Molten Rage here as well. The Magma Wave, excuse me. Method and A has also pulled the boss. 89% for them. Getting ready for their Bloodlust at any moment, I would assume, as it is available to them. 90 seconds left on the Bloodlust. Four Shells Angels separating them by 15%. 70% yeah, here, as you said, they're about to get the next, next Charson coming out. Very important to make sure that you, of course, have uh, active mitigation up for the Magma Crash. Otherwise, you'll get substantially knocked back. And like you mentioned, that's just going to be something that in any direction you just cannot have here. So with all of the Charskins being spawned right up into melee here, very important to make sure all the Crystal Spikes are spawned up. It's very similarly. That way you'll be able to consistently get uh, both of course, Crystal Spikes, the first two, spawning on top of the, the uh, Charskin, immediately getting the extra damage buff onto him, neutralize it before the third and final crystal spike comes up before the magma blast. Divine Field doing an excellent job turning the boss at his own spawns at the boss's front left right into that first crystal wall, keeping it chain stun for 100% increased damage taken. Method is starting to close the gap on the DPS right now, 7% between the two teams, 7 to 8%. We started with about an 11 to 12% deficit. Bloodlust still has not been popped on the Method and A side, but nor uh, on the Shell's Angel side, and it will be available in 30 seconds, so both teams will have access to that Bloodlust soon. At this point, you know, Shell's Angels is going to have to work off of you know, what little room they will have across this area because after every magma wave they will have to make sure that they're going to be able to just find a small new area as this just little molten uh, spots that they leave behind are going to reduce their zone by so much. Ten seconds left on Bloodless for Shells, Angels. All the battle res is available for both sides into this group here. 55% left on the side of Method NA as they're getting, again, they are starting to start ignoring the char skins here. They are getting the entangling roots out onto it. Kind of a less than favorable uh, site for the Crystal Spikes, so it looks like they'll just be using that to just hit the char skin. Bloodless going up for Shells, Angels here. 34%. This, we got a huge race on our hands. We got a huge race, but Method still has a one death difference not in their favor. They have an extra five seconds that they need to overcome versus Shell's Angels, who's starting to pull further and further ahead right now, 17% as they have popped their Bloodlust and their second round of cooldowns. I certainly hope Method hasn't forgotten about that Bloodlust, but they should be using it soon here, likely waiting to line up some of their CDs, and we're getting into that really uh, sketchy and just scary play coming out of Shell's Angels here as they will start to avoid those Char Skins. You can see just how close they are to that Scorpion pack as well. If they pull that, it's all over. Yeah, at this point, they do pop Bloodlust here as they're getting closer to, of course, the Execute phase coming up for it. Immediately once they hit that 40%, they, they absolutely just jumped on top of it. Lust has ended for the side of Shell's Angels here. Dark Rule is at 12% here, and they're getting closer and closer to these Scorpion packs. One single misstep on the side of anybody in this group, and it, like you said, it's all over for them. Method NA here. Popping their Bloodlust at 31% left onto the boss here. They have another 15 seconds of duration left available to them. Space is a lot more available because they did take care of that Scorpion here. But you are seeing the Charskins just running back into the group here, getting stunned by, of course, that Crystal Spikes here. 1% left for Shell's Angels here. 26% left for Method NA as Shell's Angels will take it. Shell's Angels have found redemption. After losing to Method NA yesterday, after being sent to the lower bracket, they have righted the wrong, they have corrected the ship, and they are now your Mythic Dungeon Invitational 2018 champions. I mean, that was just a stellar performance from them. Flawless, not a single death. Well, actually, they had one death on the board just at the very end. It, it didn't even matter. Method still had the one death disadvantage, and they just rocketed so far ahead in damage. Method started to close that gap at around the 11-12% mark. Then they closed it down to around 5 or 6, and after that, I mean, that gap just widened 25-26% until the boss just flopped over. This is a team that met after watching the 2017 MBI got together looking for group, trying, pushing keys higher and higher, trying to build a team that could compete at this level, and they have done exactly that. They are an unsponsored group of friends that have come together and taken this tournament. They've been, done an incredible job here, and like you were saying, you know, the execute, which was consistently kind of pushing Method NA ahead on uh, so many of the bosses, just wasn't quite enough for them, and Shell's Angels just got such a great job being able to come through this tournament as, as largely an unknown. Yeah, huge congratulations to these guys. What an absolutely incredible match. So close, down to the very last second. Flawless play from them until the very end. We did see they had that one death, which they had yesterday as well. But now they are being knighted by Nagura. What an honor that would be to have. I'm sure everyone in Twitch chat is very excited to see this. Perhaps next year one of you guys in Twitch chat can get knighted by Nagura as well. I mean, Rich is there too, obviously, part <laughs> of the ceremony, so it's a double-edged sword. But I do want to point out, this is a team that yesterday 
They had that moment where they didn't look amazing, do look amazing today. Rich is standing by in his jacket. Rich, get that interview going. My goodness, I mean, history has been made. The first ever MDI land. You guys are going to come out on top, and you're going to do it against a team that sent you to the lower portion of the bracket. What on earth is going through your minds right now? Everything. This is it. <laughs> This is kind of crazy. We were, you know, last night we were a bit gutted. We didn't feel like we necessarily played our best yesterday. So we just said to each other this morning, right, this is it, make or break. You come in, you play it, we smash it, and we did it, boys. Yes, we did. The question is, when you saw Nels as that final pick, what was going through your mind? Obviously, already a map that you guys had to deal with, and you dealt with it well. Then the way that it shakes out, being a best of five, that is the last map. You know it's going to end it. What do you think when you see Nels? Um, I think we were just a bit, not necessarily concerned that we'd run out of our sort of pocket picks, but you know, the vault had gone, the cost had gone, the maps that we'd shown we could do, and we just thought, you know, what are they going to bring here? To be honest, we were kind of worried it was going to be the moss. Like I said to them in the bathroom, just don't do that. Whatever you do, don't do that. And thank thankfully, wherever they are, they didn't. So cheers, guys. I mean, that, was, that was a big thing. I, I feel like walking around the arena there quite a few times, we could hear you guys going through these very, very intricate strats, and that was the theme for you guys in this tournament. You would always go big. You would always go for these plays that we knew mistakes could happen and all of a sudden you could just find yourselves very behind because of it. But if it succeeded, you would come out on top. What was it like to compete in the tournament in that way, in such a stressful way, really needing every tiny detail to go your way? I mean, nerve wracking, but to be honest, that's the angels. You know, we go big. If it doesn't work, then we recover and we pull it back. And yeah, this happens. <laughs> that is right. They are your champions. They did it in style as well. History has been made. Uh, well done to them. And uh, as we've said throughout this entirety of the tournament, it's, it's easy to watch this from home and think, okay, you know, it's just folks running dungeons. This is something I've done. But the level of mechanical execution required, especially in these 25s at the highest level of the game, it's, it's insane. The amount of concentration and focus required. So hats off to Shell's Angels. And honestly, hats off to Method NA. All of our teams here, they have played incredibly well. It's been an incredible journey as well, being able to see, you know, how well these teams have come out. And as we saw in the interview, for example, they were the sixth seed team coming out of Europe going into this, right? They took down three different Method teams to be able to get here for it. They've come such a long way and as we've been seeing they, there's been that you know constant respect from all the teams of how high the competition has been this year the method conquerors <laughs> standing on stage here i mean just a phenomenal you know we kept talking about method and a and how they've performed so well through the tournament so consistent and there too that was not an easy series by any means for shells angels method and a played fabulous but at the end of the day shells angels just eked it out a bit more now you talk about how it wasn't an easy series, but that midpoint, when we went to Upper Karazhan, just an absolute bloodbath for both teams, having the mental fortitude to recover. I mean, Sowers, how is it to come off of a map that bad and still have to go on to try to win the series? That's really the difference between these two teams and some of the teams we've seen earlier in the tournament. You know, when one player goes down, it's very important for the rest of the team to maintain their composure and get through the rest of the dungeon, and then for that player as well to maintain their composure. Both teams had that horrible disaster in the Upper Karazhan. Both of them came back together. They had two incredible dungeons following that, and it was because of that, because of their composure, because of their skill, because of their preparation, because of their knowledge, that's why they were able to make it here to the Grand Finals, and, you know, ultimately, that clean play, you know, that composure they were able to maintain throughout the entire tournament, that's why Shells Angels was able to take this and be the second MDI champions. Uh, extremely well said. Let's go ahead and take a look, one last look at this bracket and see just how Shells Angels made it to this point. So, obviously, a very strong upper bracket run until running into Method NA, and uh, it's only fitting Method NA would send them to the lower bracket so that they uh, themselves would claw back up to beat Method NA. And I got to say, you see the players socializing there. You see they're all friends after. And I think I think that really sums up what the Mythic Dungeon Invitational is, right? It's this celebration of a game we've all played for a long time. It's a celebration of a great game with great dungeons and folks coming together and building these relationships that allow them to get to these heights. And, and honestly, this is probably the coolest thing for me to see this weekend. I mean, the skill of these teams has been amazing. The production has been amazing, thanks to everyone involved in that. But just the socializing, people finally meeting for the first time that have played together for so long. You can see the two teams that that just were head to head twice this tournament, uh, like staring at each other, having fr uh, having fun, being friends. And it's just it's phenomenal to see. Yeah, you see the prizing on the board here. I, I completely agree with you. I've actually, uh, of my own choice, decided that in honor of of Coach Mitt, 
I will be playing a human paladin uh, in BFA <laughs> to celebrate my good boy, Coach Mid. Prizings there are absolutely incredible. Uh, this is money you win for running these dungeons at a high level and uh, to incentivize this, right? The, the beginnings of the Mythic Dungeon Invitation Program. It's, it's incredible to see folks who saw this, saw what was happening in 2017 and said, hey, I want to get in on this. I can build a team. And they're just doing it through the game, right? They're just, hey, you seem really good at this. We ran this dungeon together. I'm going to add you on my friends list. Let's see where this goes. And especially because it has just been, like you mentioned, such a new program to it, having just the second Mythic Dungeon Invitational, having such a hype, hyped up event, but also just showing the growth in terms of how well these teams have been able to perform here. You know, the dungeons have been closer than we've ever been able to see. We've been able to have such phenomenal performances out of these teams where, you know, even just balancing everything on the razor's edge, if one of those teams would have wiped or had an extra death or any of those things, they would have just completely given the favor to the other. Yeah. All right, well, let's talk about BlizzCon real quick, as there's also uh, more story to go in 2018. At BlizzCon, the Mythic Dungeon Invitational All-Stars event, these are the four teams that have qualified. We have two teams from Europe, one team from Asia Pacific, one team from North America, two teams from Method. So, uh, as you said, Slute, Shells Angels kind of played spoiler there to the Method organization, but Method will still be there at BlizzCon, so uh, some pretty solid consolation prizes all around. Uh, I, I mean, con consolation goes well beyond that. I mean, these are the, the four best teams in the world as of right now at this MDI, and they will have just the ability and the grace to bless us all with the first preview of BFA Dungeons, of course, going into this BlizzCon tournament. Legion is now behind us. A fantastic time for everybody, and it's time to move to BFA. I think that's a good point to say, is this this is really crowning the final champions of Legion. We are closing out this expansion, at least as far as the Mythic Dungeon program is concerned, and uh, these are our champions moving into Battle for Azeroth. Yeah, go out there, meet some new friends, do some dungeons, get ready for the Battle for Azeroth. It's got a whole new expansion. Anyone is able to, you know, progress with these dungeons. All you need is a couple of good friends. Maybe you want to try tanking the next expansion. Maybe you want to try healing the next expansion. There are so many ways you can get out there and improve yourself as a player, excel in these mythic dungeons, and have a ton of fun. As you said, good friends who maybe are good at the game, so maybe you want to make sure you're being <laughs> a little choosier in terms of who you bring. But... Sorry, MDI sorry, might Rob. be over. Yeah, I'm not invited. <laughs> uh, I'll be there for the pet battle tournament. The PvP uh, championships are coming up here. Be sure to watch AWC Poland, July 14th, July 15th. Check out our good friends over in the PvP scene. Obviously, we're done for a little while, but there's still more Warcraft esports to catch an eye full of. I'm excited about this. I, You know, watching PvP is something where uh, the action is maybe a little faster paced than the dungeon, so it's a good break. It's a good break until uh, we actually get to BlizzCon. Yeah, the, just the hype you have, you know, one land that we're having here in Columbus, and they're sending off the next one to Poland. It's been a pleasure to be able to you know, be a part of this one, but it'd be so cool to be able to watch the PvP one coming up this following month, and a lot more Warcraft as well. Yeah, uh, Warcraft Esports uh, certainly going global as we're seeing, so uh, final thoughts wrapping it up. Gentlemen, let's go down the line. Final thoughts on this event, on this whole tournament. Uh, the whole tournament, I, I think I've already said it, so I don't want to waste too much time saying it. I'm sure these guys want to talk, too. It's really just, uh, hey, hey. You Slute wait your not turn. wanting to talk. I don't believe that. <laughs> um, it, it's really just the seeing the, the friendships, the socializing, and the bonding from all these players and all of the MDI crew involved with the teams, too. It's been an exceptional experience meeting these guys, having a bite to eat with them, and just really seeing where they're coming from. It just puts so much heart into the cast that we do towards them. Yeah, and as you're seeing right here, just the camaraderie really from a lot of these teams where they have been all putting all this work into, you know, making this a success for them and getting to this point. Everybody kind of has that mutual respect of, you know, the sacrifices that they had to make to kind of get to this. It's been an absolute privilege to be a part of. Yeah, it's been such a huge honor to be a part of this MDI. So much fun and so much work goes behind the scenes to make all this possible. Make sure to let everyone know just how much you love this event so that we can see more like it in the future. It's fantastic all around. Yeah, hell of a class photo we see going on on the stage there. And, uh, I just want to echo what you guys have said. You know, when we did this last year, this was certainly a, a bit of a smaller program. We had less uh, members of the talent crew. So want to say sour, or sour shout out to you, as well as the rest of folks have joined us, the production crew, everybody here in Columbus, Ohio at the MLG Arena. And thank all of you for watching. Without you, there would be no Mythic Dungeon Invitational. Thank you so much, and we'll see you at BlizzCon.